Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. We begin today's show looking at the case of Asada Shakur, a legendary figure within the Black Panther Party and the Black Liberation Army. On Thursday, she became the first woman ever to make the FBI's most wanted terrorist list. In addition, the FBI in the state of New Jersey doubled the reward for her capture to $2 million. Shakur was convicted in the May 2, 1973 killing of a New York, of a New Jersey uh, state trooper uh, during a shootout that left one of her fellow activists dead. Uh, she was shot twice by police during the incident. In 1979, she managed to escape from jail, and she later fled to Cuba, where she received political asylum. She has long proclaimed her innocence. On Thursday, FBI Special Agent Aaron Ford spoke at a press conference announcing Shakur's placement on the most wanted terrorist list. He refers to Shakur as Joanne Chesimar, her original name. Openly and freely in Cuba, she continues to maintain and promote her terrorist ideology. She provides anti-U.S. government speeches espousing the Black Liberation Army message of revolution and terrorism. No person, no matter what his or her political or moral convictions are, is above the law. Joanne Chesimard is a domestic terrorist who murdered a law enforcement officer execution style. That's FBI Special Agent Aaron Ford. In a moment, we'll be joined by two guests, the scholar and activist Angela Davis, who faced her own murder trial decades ago, and Lennox Hines, Asada Shakur's longtime attorney for some 40 years. But first, we turn to Asada Shakur in her own words. In 1998, Democracy Now! aired her reading an open letter to Pope John Paul II during his trip to Cuba. She wrote the message after New Jersey state troopers sent the Pope a letter asking him to call for her extradition. My name is Asada Shakur, and I was born and raised in the United States. I am a descendant of Africans who were kidnapped and brought to the Americas as slaves. I spent my early childhood in the racist, segregated South. I later moved to the northern part of the country where I realized that black people were equally victimized by racism and oppression. I grew up and became a political activist, participating in student struggles the anti-war movement, and most of all, in the movement for the liberation of African Americans in the United States. I later joined the Black Panther Party, an organization that was targeted by the COINTELPRO program, a program that was set up by the Federal Bureau of Investigation to eliminate all political opposition to the U.S. government's policies to destroy the black liberation movement in the United States, to discredit activists, and to eliminate potential leaders. Under the COINTELPRO program, many political activists were harassed, imprisoned, murdered, or otherwise neutralized. As a result of being targeted by COINTELPRO, I, like many other young people, was faced with the threat of prison, underground, exile, or death. The FBI, with the help of local police agencies, systematically fed false accusations and fake news articles to the press, accusing me and other activists of crimes we did not commit. Although in my case the charges were eventually dropped or I was eventually acquitted, the national and local police agencies created a situation where based on their false accusations against me, any police officer could shoot me on sight. It was not until the Freedom of Information Act was passed in the mid-70s that we began to see the scope of the United States government's persecution of political activists. 
at this point, I think that it is important to make one thing very clear. I have advocated and I still advocate revolutionary changes in the structure and in the principles that govern the United States. I advocate self-determination for my people and for all oppressed people inside the United States. I advocate an end to capitalist exploitation, the abolition of racist policies, the eradication of sexism, and the elimination of political repression. If that is a crime, then I am totally guilty. To make a long story short, I was captured in New Jersey in 1973 after being shot with both arms held in the air and then shot again from the back. I was left on the ground to die, and when I did not, I was taken to a local hospital where I was threatened, beaten, and tortured. In 1977, I was convicted in a trial that can only be described as a legal lynching. In 1979, I was able to escape with the aid of some of my fellow comrades. I saw this as a necessary step, not only because I was innocent of the charges against me, but because I knew that the racist legal system in the United States, I would receive no justice. I was also afraid that I would be murdered in prison. I later arrived in Cuba, where I am currently living in exile as a political refugee. The New Jersey State Police and other law enforcement officials say they want to see me brought to justice. But I would like to know what they mean by justice. Is torture justice? I was kept in solitary confinement for more than two years, mostly in men's prisons. Is that justice? My lawyers were threatened with imprisonment and imprisoned. Is that justice? I was tried by an all-white jury without even the pretext of impartiality and then sentenced to life in prison plus 33 years. Is that justice? Let me emphasize that justice for me is not the issue I am addressing here. It is justice for my people that is at stake. When my people receive justice, I am sure that I will receive it too. In the spirit of God, in the spirit of the ancestors, in the spirit of the Black Panthers, in the spirit of Asada Shakur, we make this movement towards freedom for all those who have been oppressed and all those in the struggle. Yeah, yeah, check it. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hoping to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Friday. May 8th, 2015. So I have been told. Signature work on the cows with this broadcast. Signature work. Uh, I would really, I would say the, the last uh, three book study sessions. All signature work and, and ties together nicely. Uh, we have done three consecutive uh, biographies. Uh, American Sniper, the autobiography of Malcolm X as told to Alex Haley, and now Asada Shakur, Asada, an autobiography. Signature work here uh, at the Cows, and I think it would be fascinating for listeners to uh, kind of pay attention to the uh, connections and how you would contrast these works, I would say, particularly the reason that I picked this book uh, as a follow up to Malcolm X, which we just finished up. Uh, this book is talking about a period of time that is right. I mean, it would be such a, a lovely follow up to Minister Malcolm X. It's almost like she's picking up where he left off at uh, last week uh, and continuing this narrative of black people 
uh, resisting and fighting against racism, white supremacy. Uh, I think this will be uh, especially nice, timely to read this book uh, at this moment with uh, the renewed conversation about uh, Asada Shakur with regards to what's happening in Cuba right now. I uh, just I heard a presidential candidate and suspected racist uh, talking about what a terrorist uh, they are harboring down in Cuba and we need to uh, bring her back. Uh, and someone had just uh, said this week that it would send the correct message to the world. Uh, if, you know, Asada Shakur, this black female, was to uh, return to be confined and caged uh, in New Jersey. Uh, I think there was just a controversy with Common uh, a few weeks back. Uh, our guests on the program from the University of California, Berkeley, were talking about they wanted one of the student buildings renamed after Asada Shakur. And even the book uh, that we just read, The Land Was Ours, talking about black people who owned waterfront property in North Carolina. Those were Asada Shakur's grandparents. She talks about it in this book and her aunt, Evelyn Williams, also talks about it. In fact, her aunt was an attorney who worked uh, on behalf of Asada and worked on half, uh, behalf of Asada's grandparents in trying to help her family keep this land. Uh, at any rate, without further ado, uh, very important work and uh, looking forward to reading our narrator, a cow's listener, Chi, outstanding narration of a very powerful and important work. Asada Shakur, Asada, an autobiography, context of white supremacy. Asada Shakur. An Autobiography Affirmation I believe in living. I believe in the spectrum of beta days and gamma people. I believe in sunshine, in windmills and waterfalls, tricycles and rocking chairs. And I believe that seeds grow into sprouts, and sprouts grow into trees. I believe in the magic of the hands and in the wisdom of the eyes. I believe in rain and tears and in the blood of infinity. I believe in life, and I have seen the death parade march through the torso of the earth, sculpting mud bodies in its path. I have seen the destruction of the daylight and seen bloodthirsty maggots prayed to and saluted. I have seen the kind become the blind, and the blind become the bind in one easy lesson. I have walked on cut grass. I have eaten crow and blundered bread and breathed the stench of indifference. I have been locked by the lawless, handcuffed by the haters, gagged by the greedy, and if I know anything at all, it's that a wall is just a wall and nothing more at all. It can be broken down. I believe in living. I believe in birth. I believe in the sweat of love and in the fire of truth. And I believe that a lost ship, steered by tired, seasick sailors, can still be guided home to port. Chapter 1 There were lights and sirens. Zaid was dead. My mind knew that Zaid was dead. The air was like cold glass. Huge bubbles rose and burst. Each one felt like an explosion in my chest. My mouth tasted like blood and dirt. The car spun around me, and then something like sleep overtook me. In the background, I could hear what sounded like gunfire, but I was fading and dreaming. Suddenly, the door flew open, and I felt myself being dragged out onto the pavement, pushed and punched, a foot upside my head, a kick in the stomach. Police were everywhere. One had a gun to my head. Which way did they go? He was shouting. Bitch, you better open your goddamn mouth or I'll blow your goddamn head off. I nodded my head across the highway. I was sure that nobody had gone that way. 
A few of the cops were off and running. One pig said, We ought to finish her off. But the others were all busy around the car, searching it. They were pulling and prodding. You find a gun? They kept asking each other. Later, one of them asked another, Should we put her in the car? Nah, let her lay in the gutter where she belongs. Just get her out of the way. I felt myself being dragged by the feet across the pavement. My chest was on fire. My blouse was purple with blood. I was convinced that my arm had been shot off and was hanging inside my shirt by a few strips of flesh. I could not feel it. Finally, the ambulance came, and they moved me into it. Being moved was agony, but the blankets were worth it. I was so cold. The medics examined me. I tried to talk, but only bubbles came out. I was foaming at the mouth. Where she hit? They asked each other as if I wasn't there. They concluded their examination. I was relieved. Let's move it, one of them said. Okay, but wait a minute, said the driver, and he got out. Hit twice, I heard him say. We gotta wait. The driver slammed the door. He said something else, but I didn't understand it. Time passed. I was floating off again. It felt so weird, like a dream, a nightmare. More time passed. It seemed like forever. I was in and out, in and out. A rough voice asked, Is she dead yet? I floated off again. I heard another voice. Is she dead yet? I wondered how long the ambulance had been sitting there. The attendants looked nervous. The bubbles in my chest felt like they were growing bigger. When they burst, my whole chest shattered. I faded again, and it was down south in the summertime. I thought about my grandmother. At last, the ambulance was moving. If I live, I remember thinking, I'll only have one arm. The hospital is glaring white. Everybody I see is white. Everyone seems to be waiting. All at once, they are in motion. Blood pressure, pulse, needles, etc. Two detectives come in. I know they're detectives because they look like detectives. One of them has a face like a bulldog, with jowls hanging down the sides. They supervise the nurse as she cuts off my clothes. After a while, one of them dabs my fingertips with what looks like Q-tips. Later, I find out that this is the neutron activation test to determine whether or not I have fired a weapon. Another one then tries to fingerprint me, but he has trouble because my hand is dead. Give me the dead man's kit. He puts my fingers into spoon-looking things used to fingerprint dead people. They begin to ask me questions, but a bunch of doctors come in. One of them, who appears to be the head doctor, examines me. He pokes and prods, throwing me around like a rag doll. Then, like he's going to kill me, he jerks me around so that I'm on my stomach. The pain is like an electric shock. I moan. Don't cry now, girly, he says. Why do you shoot the trooper? Why do you shoot the trooper? I want to kick him in his face. I know he would kill me if he had the chance. I can see the scalpel slipping. One of the other doctors says something about calling the operating room. Hell no is all I can think of. Hell no. After a while, they all leave. Then a black nurse comes into the room. I'm as glad as I could be to see her. She bends over me. What is your name? She asks. What is your name? I think about it and decide to say nothing. If I tell them my name, they will know who I am and they will kill me for sure. What is your name? She keeps asking, enunciating each syllable in the way that people talk to someone who has trouble hearing or understanding. What is your name? What is your address? Where do you live? Her voice is getting louder. We need your signature, miss, she says, waving a piece of paper in front of me. We need your permission for treatment in case we have to operate. She repeats the same thing 
over and over. Who shall we contact in case of emergency? I think that's kind of funny. What is your name? Where do you live? I close my eyes, wishing she would go away. She keeps right on talking. I drift off, thinking about my arm. It is still there. Nerve damage. Paralyzed, I heard them say. It has never occurred to me. It isn't that bad, I remember thinking. I can live with that if I have to. More voices. Other voices. Grating my ears and my consciousness. She can talk, one is saying. The doctor says she can talk. Where were you going? What is your name? Where were you coming from? Who was in the car with you? How many of you were there? I know she can hear me. I keep my eyes closed. One of them leans down real close to me. I feel his breath on my cheek and smell it. I know you can hear me and I know you can talk. And if you don't hurry up and start talking, I'm going to bash your face in for you. My eyes fly open in spite of myself. Immediately, they are all in my face, throwing question after question at me. I say nothing. After a while, I close my eyes again. Aw, she doesn't feel good, one of them says in a sweet, mocking voice. Where does it hurt? Here, here, here? With each here comes a crash. I look around wildly, but no one is there. More thumps and punches, but none of them hurts as bad as my chest is hurting. I try to scream, but I know immediately that that's a mistake. My chest erupts, and I think I am going to die. They go on and on, questions and bangs. I think they will never stop. A woman's voice. Telephone. Thank you, one of them says, giving me an ugly grin. They are gone. Another pig comes in. A black pig in a uniform. He comes closer, and I see that he is not a cop, but a hospital security guard. He stands not too far from where I am lying, and I can see that he is not at all hostile. His face breaks into a kind of reserved smile, and very discreetly, he clenches his fist and gives me the power sign. That man will never know how much better he made me feel at that moment. The detectives come back with the nurse. They begin to move the stretcher. My mind races. Where are they taking me? The only place I can think of is the operating room. When we arrive at the x-ray room, I'm thankful. Because I have to move around, the x-rays are painful, but the technician is cool. X-rays are over, and I am rolled down the hallway, determined to keep my eyes closed. All of a sudden, flashes of light. My eyes pop open. This time, They are taking my picture. The police photographer asks, Don't you want to give us a smile? Come on, give us a smile. I close my eyes again. We are moving. The stretcher stops. One of the pigs tells the nurse he has a headache. She volunteers to get him something. The stretcher is moving again. Where the hell are they taking me? Again, the light is changing, and although my eyes are closed... I can feel the difference. It feels like I'm in the dark. I can't take it any longer, and I look. The room is dark, but there is some light. My eyes slowly adjust. There's something lying next to me. I can see an outline, something in plastic, something... My mind slowly realizes that it is a man in a plastic bag. And that the man is Zaid. My body stiffens. My mind spins. One of the troopers says, That's what's going to happen to you before the night is over if you don't tell us what we want to know. I say nothing, but inside I'm raging. Dogs, swine, filthy pigs, dirty, slimy scum, bastards, sons of bitches. I rage on and on. I wouldn't tell you the right time of day. I remember thinking, I wouldn't tell you that shit stinks. The night crawls along. Nurses, doctors, and troopers. I am still scared, but I am just as angry and evil as I am scared. 
The detectives are in and out, and when nobody is there except them, they get in their digs and bangs. But after a while, I don't think about them too much. I am thinking about living, about surviving, thinking about what is going to happen next. They are going to do what they are going to do, and there isn't much I can do about it. I just have to be myself, stay as strong as I can, and do my best. That's all. There is nowhere to run, and I'm in no shape to try. I realize how isolated and vulnerable I am. What if I really do need an operation? I need help from the outside world. I have to try to get word out to someone. The black nurse has been back and forth asking me the same questions. Each time, I have closed my eyes until she goes away. I decide to ask her to get in touch with my people the next time she comes by. Maybe she will be cool. She is my best shot. The guard is long gone. I doze off for a little while. When I wake up, a nurse and a priest are standing over me. The priest is mumbling and seems to be rubbing something on my forehead. At first, I don't understand what he is doing. Then it dawns on me. Last rites. Last rites are for the dying. Go away, I say out loud. I don't have the strength to say anything else, but I know I don't want anybody's last rites. I am not going to die, and even if I do die, I am not going to die nobody's hypocrite. The black nurse comes back and starts her questions again. Before she can get started good, I beckon her to come closer. There is no one else around. I ask her to get in contact with my lawyer, who is also my aunt. I give her my name and ask her to make the call herself. She has a hard time understanding me and keeps asking me to repeat my name. I can barely talk, and each time she asks me to repeat myself, I feel like screaming. Then it occurs to me that Asada is foreign to her ears. She has probably never heard that name before. So I give her my slave name. Then I give her the number, and she is off and running. Two minutes later, the detectives are on me like white on rice. They threaten and plead, reason and offer me the world. They hurl question after question at me, acting crazier than before. One plays the nice cop, who is trying to save me from the bad cop, if only I will cooperate. I am tired, and their act is even tireder. I can see exhaustion in their faces. The whole night is coming down on me. Their voices begin to sound far away. I can't take it anymore. They can go to hell. I am going to sleep. This time, I am going out for real. When I wake up, the stretcher is moving. After a while, we arrive at the intensive care part of the hospital. The place is packed with nurses. I am elated. All I want to do is sleep. Soon, I'm drifting off again. I wake up, and it's the next day. The doctors are making their rounds. One of them, an intern, I think, is very kind to me. They examine me and spend the rest of the morning doing blood tests, x-rays, EKGs, etc., etc. Soon, I learn that they're going to move me again. I also find out that I'm in Middlesex County Hospital. I hear the nurses talking. They are glad I am being moved because the police are driving them crazy. When they come to move me, it looks like a police parade. The rooms I am moved to are called the Johnson Suite. I can't believe it. I have never imagined that hospitals have rooms like this. There is a sitting room, a huge hospital-equipped room where I am kept, a den, a kitchen, a full bathroom, and another little room whose purpose I will never learn. They transfer me to the bed and handcuff one of my legs to the side rail. I keep looking around. It is elegant and clearly for rich people. I am probably the first black person who has ever been in this room, and the only reason I am there is for security. They have sealed off the doors, and no one can enter except through the sitting room next door where three state troopers are stationed, two regulars and one sergeant. The police radio in the room cackles all day long. A carload of suspicious-looking coloreds in a white Ford coupe, a suspicious-looking negro walking near the hospital in a blue jacket and sneakers. No suspicious-looking white people are reported. 
From listening to the police talk next door and to the radio, I learned that the hospital is saturated with state troopers. They seem to be under the impression that somebody is going to try and break me out. I feel better. The dim roll has me flying a little and makes it easier for me to lie in the contorted position I am forced into because of the cuff on my leg. Later that afternoon, it begins again. Detectives and more detectives. Questions and more questions. This time, the questions are different. Now they want to know about the Black Liberation Army. How big is it? What cities is it in? Who is in it? Etc., etc. But the main focus of their questions centers around the guy that got away. I am delighted. I figure that Sundiata is somewhere safe by now, cooling out. They are more careful where and how they hit me now. I guess they don't want to leave any marks. One sticks his fingers in my eyes. I don't know what he has on his fingertips, but whatever it is burns like hell. I think I am going to be blind forever. He says he will keep doing it until I am completely blind. I close my eyes and hold them as tight as I can. He strikes me a few more times. Some of the stuff gets into my eyes anyway. Burning tears pour down my face and my whole head is throbbing. I think he is going to keep on, but he begins to curse me, calling me all kind of nigger bitches. Finally, he and the others leave. On one of those first days, a white doctor comes to examine me. He acts very nice, sweet as pie. He examines me slowly, the whole time making friendly conversation. I wonder what kind of specialist he is, since I haven't seen him before, and I know he isn't one of the regulars. He says he knows how terrible I must feel, and makes a big deal of protesting that I am chained to the bed. He keeps on talking, and after a while pulls a chair close to the bed. Then he starts to ask friendly little questions. The conversation goes something like this. Those guys on the turnpike are rough. They'll give you a ticket for anything. I take the turnpike every day. You live in Jersey? I live in Newark. You ever been there? You must be really lonely up here. I'll bet you really need someone to talk to. I went to medical school in New York. You're from there, aren't you? I get suspicious and say nothing to him. I tell him I want to go to sleep, and he leaves. I never saw him again, but to this day, I'm convinced that he was some kind of police or FBI agent. On the third or fourth day, most of my troubles came to an end. Well, not really, but the punch, bang, poke, and prod part of my troubles ended. A nurse with a German accent came to my aid. She was one of the morning nurses, very professional and exacting, to the point that she could be a pain in the neck. But she was a lifesaver. It was she who first protested the tightness of the handcuff on my leg. My leg had begun to swell, and she had insisted that they loosen it, and that the cuff be covered with gauze. Of course, as soon as she was gone, they tightened it again, but the gauze helped somewhat. I could tell by the little things she said and did that she knew what was going on. One morning, she came in as usual, and after she'd finished her morning routine... She reached behind the bed, pulled at something, and then handed me an electric call button on a cord. Anytime you need me or need anything from the nurses, just press this button, she said. Don't be afraid to use it, she added, giving me a knowing look. I could have kissed her. Later, when she returned to the room, after the troopers realized I had a call button, one came in behind her. Is there any way to disconnect that thing? he asked. She might hurt someone with it or hurt herself. No, she said. There is no way to remove it. If you pull it out, it will just keep ringing in the nurse's station. She is having difficulty breathing and she needs it. Right on, I thought. Das ist reicht. After that, whenever the police came within two feet of my bed, I would push the button. Finally, they gave up the idea of beating on me, and contented themselves with threats and other kinds of harassment. A favorite was to stand in the door and point their guns at me. Each day was my last day on earth. Each night was my last night. After a while, I became accustomed, immune. Sometimes they would cock a gun I didn't know was empty, give a long, impassioned speech, and then pull the trigger. 
Other times, I was invited to a game of Russian roulette. They all expressed a bitter hatred for me. They were state troopers, and I was accused of killing one of them. Every day, there were three shifts of police. When they changed shifts, the two troopers would salute the sergeant. Some saluted an army salute, but others saluted like the Nazis did in Germany. They held their hands in front of them and clicked their heels. I couldn't believe it. One day, one of them came in and gave me a speech about how he fought in World War II on the wrong side. He went on and on, and there was no question that he believed everything he said. He talked about how messed up the world is, how decent people couldn't walk the streets. He said that if Hitler had won, the world wouldn't be in the mess it is in today, that niggers like me, no good niggers, wouldn't be going around shooting New Jersey State Troopers. He went on to say that the white race had invented everything, because they were smart and worked hard, that other races wanted to riot and use terrorism to take everything the white race had worked so hard to get. I had a hard time keeping my mouth shut. He talked about empires, the Roman, the Greek, the Spanish, the British. He told me white people created empires because they were more civilized than the rest of the world. White people created ballet and opera and symphonies. Did you ever hear of a nigger writing a symphony? He asked. Every day he would give me a speech about Nazism. Sometimes other Nazis would join in. I asked him if there were a lot of Nazis in the state troopers, but he just laughed and kept on talking. When I was in the Black Panther Party, we used to call the police fascist pigs. But I had called them fascists not because I believed they were Nazis, but because of the way they acted in our communities. As many times as I had referred to police as fascists, these shocked me by the truth of my own rhetoric. I later learned that the state troopers in New Jersey was started by a German, that their uniforms were patterned after some type of German uniform, very similar to the uniform South African police wear, that they are notorious for stopping black, Hispanic, and long-haired people on the turnpike and beating, harassing, and arresting them. The Nazis headed the harassment campaign against me. They spit in my food and turned down the thermostat in the room until it was freezing. For a while, their campaign centered on keeping me from sleeping. They stamped their feet on the floor, sang songs all night, played with their guns, shouted. I told the nurses about it, but it was no use. I could deal with whatever they were putting out, but how long would this go on? I had heard nothing from the outside world, and I didn't even know if anybody knew where I was or whether I was dead or alive. My chest was feeling better, but I could hardly breathe. I thought I was past the point of needing an operation, but I wasn't sure if it was because of the painkillers they had given me or because I was really getting better. Every day, I asked them to contact my lawyer, and every day they said they had tried, but there was no answer. I knew that was a lie because Evelyn had an answering service. Every day I asked them to contact my family. Their response to this was usually obscene. Oh, you got a family, do you? Is your mother a nigger whore like you? We don't allow no pickaninnies at this hospital. They went on and on about my family, until they found something else to go on and on about. Whoever said that no news is good news had to be out of his mind. Well, there was news, but it wasn't good news. They told me they had arrested Sundiata. At first, I didn't believe them, but they were too glib and arrogant. I knew something had happened. We got your friend, they said, and he's singing like a bird. Yeah, he's singing like a bird and he's giving you all the weight. It's a good thing for you he didn't know what color undies you had on or he would have told us that. We know where you were coming from. We know where you were going. We know that you stopped at a Howard Johnson. He even told us what you ordered and that you just love potato chips. What? I thought, how do they know that? Then I remembered that we had bought potato chips at a Howard Johnson on the turnpike. Maybe someone had seen me and remembered. Yeah, Clark Squire tells us that you took the trooper's gun and shot him in the head. Now you wouldn't do a thing like that, would you? Well, Joanne, you're in a hell of a fix. If I were you, I wouldn't let him get away with it. It's a low-down thing to do, giving all the weight to a woman. I'll make a deal with you. You tell us everything that happened, and I promise we'll go light on you. I just don't like seeing you get a bad break, that's all. You know, you're facing a lot of time in prison. 
the way things stand. And if he testifies against you, you could get life in prison or even the chair. But all you have to do is tell us what happened and we'll see to it that you just do a couple of years and go home. You're young. You don't want to rot away your whole life in prison, do you? Maybe you think you owe something to the cause. You think he's thinking about the cause now? No, he's singing his head off, trying to give you all the weight. They're all the same. They talk all this shit about black people, equal rights, civil rights. But when it comes down to the wire, all they care about is their hide. He's thinking about his hide, and you better think about yours. You think the cause gives a damn about you? Your own people don't give a damn about you. To them, you're just a common criminal. Now I'm giving you this one chance to save yourself and come clean. If you don't take it, you're a fool. They really did think black people were stupid. Their line had to be the oldest in the book. He was sitting there like he just knew his corny little speech had done the trick. I said nothing. If you don't say anything to them, they have nothing to turn around and use against you. Divide and conquer has always been their motto. When they realized I wasn't going to talk, they began to leave. Then one came back. Oh, he said, I almost forgot to read you your rights. He pulled out a little card and read from it. You have the right to remain silent. Uh, you have the right to... Uh, Etc. I wouldn't want you to say that we didn't read you your rights. Thursday afternoon. They're letting me make a phone call. I don't believe it. I call my aunt. She's not in. The answering service answers. I don't know who else to call. The only lawyers whose names I know worked on the Panther 21 trial. I call them at random. No one is in. But secretaries promise to give them messages. I'm disappointed, but I feel a lot better. Things are looking up. It is Friday. From the activity in the room next door, I can tell something is up. Voices and whispers, they are back and forth. In and out, arranging this, uh, moving that. The police radio is jumping. What is happening? Whatever it is, it can't be too bad, I think. They are leaving me alone. In a little while, a policewoman comes in. She is in a brown uniform, and her insignia says Sheriff's Department. She's black or Hispanic, I can't tell exactly, except that she isn't white. Then some more police come in, dressed in uniforms similar to hers. Then more police. They are state troopers. One of them moves to the door and stands at attention. Then some men in suits come in. Then a man comes in with a stenographic machine. The Honorable Joseph F. Bradshaw, State of New Jersey, County of Middlesex, all rise. Then this judge walks in with a black robe on. One of the men in a suit reads the charges against me. We are here today to serve complaints upon you for the matters arising out of the shooting of May 2nd of 1973. I will read you the complaints, leave copies with you of the charges that will be pending against you. The judge will then advise you on the arraignment of such rights you may have. You are charged under complaint number 119977 by Detective Taranto, New Jersey State Police, who says that on the 2nd of May 1973, within the confines of the township of East Brunswick, County of Middlesex, that you unlawfully and illegally resisted a lawful arrest being made by New Jersey State Trooper James Harper by discharging a dangerous pistol and wounding the said James Harper and fleeing the scene of the incident, all in violation of NJS 2A 85-1. You were also charged under complaint number S-119-979 by Detective Sergeant Taranto of the New Jersey State Police, who says that on the 2nd of May 1973, within the township of East Brunswick, County of Middlesex, that you did commit an atrocious assault and battery upon New Jersey State Trooper James Harper by shooting, wounding, and maiming the said James Harper with a handgun, then and there discharged by the defendant, all in violation of NJS 2A 90-1. In the second count, you are charged by the said officer who says that defendant Joanne Deborah Chesimard did on the aforementioned date and place unlawfully and illegally assault the said James Harper with the intent to kill, murder, and slay him by use of a handgun, then and there held by the defendant all in violation of NJS 2A 90-2.
It charges further in the third count that the aforementioned defendant did at the above-mentioned time and place commit an unlawful and illegal assault and battery on a law enforcement officer, to wit, one James Harper, a duly sworn trooper of the New Jersey State Police, by discharging a firearm and wounding the said James Harper, all in violation of NJS to A90-4. In S-119980, you are charged with illegally and unlawfully committing the crime of murder by willfully and with malice aforethought, shooting, killing, and slaying New Jersey State Trooper Werner Forrester, all in violation of NJS-2A-113-1 and NJS-2A-85-14. You are further being charged under S-119981 with one count wherein Detective Sergeant Toronto charges you on the second day of May 1973 within the township of East Brunswick County of Middlesex that you did unlawfully, illegally, and with malice aforethought cause or affect the murder of James Costin, a.k.a. Zaid Shakur, while resisting or avoiding a lawful arrest then and there being affected by New Jersey State Trooper James Harper, all in violation of NJS 2A 113-1. You are charged with S-119982 by State Police Sergeant Louis Taranto that on the second day of May 1973 in the township of East Brunswick County of Middlesex, you unlawfully and illegally possessed on your person, under your custody and control, an illegal weapon, to wit, one Browning 9mm automatic pistol, one Browning automatic .380 caliber, one .38 caliber llama automatic pistol, serial number 24831, all without having obtained any necessary permit for the carrying of same in violation of NJS 2A 151-41A. You are further charged in complaint S-119-983, wherein Detective Sergeant Toronto says on the second day of May 1973 in the township of East Brunswick County of Middlesex that you did unlawfully and illegally and forcibly take from the person of New Jersey State Trooper Warner Forrester a .38 caliber revolver by violence to wit by shooting, slaying, and killing the same Warner Forrester, all in violation of NJS 2A 141-1. The second count of that complaint charges you with committing that act while being armed in violation of NJS 2A 151-5. You are being charged by State Trooper Detective Sergeant Toronto, complaint S-119984, who says on the second day of May 1973 in the township of East Brunswick County of Middlesex that you did illegally, unlawfully conspire with James Costin, a.k.a. Zaid Shakur, and one John Doe to commit the crime of murder of the said Trooper. Trooper Warner Forrester, and in the effectuation of said conspiracy, did execute the following overt acts. 1. That the said defendant, Joanne Deborah Chesimard, did have in her possession a pistol with which to effectuate the ends of the conspiracy on the above-mentioned time and at the above-mentioned place. 2. The above-named defendant, Joanne Deborah Chesimard, in concert with and by common scheme and plan, did assault Trooper James Harper and otherwise discharge her weapon at the said Trooper James Harper with the intent to affect the ends of conspiracy by otherwise wounding, maiming, or killing him, all in violation of NJS 2A 98-1 and NJS 2A 113-1. I think he will never stop. Half of the charges I don't even understand. I interrupt the proceedings. I don't have a lawyer, I protest. I would like to have a lawyer present. They ignore me and keep on reading. How do you plead? They ask me. I would like to have a lawyer present. Don't I have a right to a lawyer? That will not be necessary, the judge says coldly. Enter a plea of not guilty for the defendant. And just as quickly as they entered, the procession departs. Later, that same policewoman comes back. She stands rigidly against the wall. Her face is a mask. Oh no, I think. Court again? What are they going to do? Railroad me here and now? I imagine myself being tried right there in the bed with no lawyer. The door opens. It is Evelyn, my lawyer and aunt. She is the most beautiful sight in the world. She embraces me and sits down next to me. As usual, she is business first. I only have five minutes, she tells me. They told me that I couldn't see you. I had to go to court and get a court order to see you. The judge would give us only five minutes apiece. Your mother and sister are outside, so talk fast. We look up. And the police are practically standing in our mouths. I would like to talk with my client in private, 
Evelyn says. Would you please move back? This is an outrage. This is an attorney-client visit, and we have a constitutional right to privacy. The police move back one inch. I tell Evelyn about the kangaroo court in the morning. My mouth moves so fast, it's like one of those old-style movies, but it's hulky. I can see from the expression on her face that I must look horrible. How are they treating you? She asks. I don't have time to tell her the whole story, but I have to let her know what is going on. I don't know what they will do next. I have to try to get someone to put pressure on them to stop. I tell her some of it, but I just can't tell her the worst things. Her face looks so pitiful, and every time I tell her something, her hands shake. Try to do what you can, I say. Time's up! Time's up, miss! Evelyn makes her futile protests. I need to talk with my client. This is just not enough time. Sorry, miss. Time's up. They move toward her like they are going to beat her up. Then she is gone. I brace myself for my mother and my sister. It has been such a long time since I have seen them. I don't know what to expect. My mother comes in. She looks worried, but strong. She kisses me. I'm proud of you, she says. The words spin around me, weaving a warm blanket of love. I am so happy. I can hardly contain myself. My mother is proud of me. She loves me. And she is proud of me. Too soon, the time with my mother is up. My sister comes in, and she has her hair wrapped in a turban, and she looks so pale. As soon as she sees me, she breaks out crying. Tears stream down her already puffy face. I can tell she has been crying a lot. I love you, she says simply. We don't do a lot of talking, but I feel so very close to her during those few minutes. Time's up, again, and then she is gone. I lie there full of emotion. All of this is so hard on my family. They look vulnerable and shaken. This is maybe harder on them than it is on me. I wish there was something I can do to make them happy. Two black nurses were very kind to me. When they were on duty, they would go out of their way to make sure I was all right. They made frequent trips to my room, for which I was especially grateful during those first days. If you need anything, just ring, they said knowingly. One night, one of the nurses came in and gave me three books. I hadn't even thought about reading. The books were a godsend. They had been carefully selected. One was a book of black poetry. One was a book of black poetry. One was a book called Black Women in White America, and the third was a novel, Siddhartha, by Herman Hess. Whenever I tired of the verbal abuse of my captors, I would drown them out by reading the poetry out loud. Invictus and If We Must Die were the poems I usually read. I read them over and over until I was sure the guards had heard every word. The poems were my message to them. When I read the book about black women, I felt the spirits of those sisters feeding me, making me stronger. Black women have been struggling and helping each other to survive the blows of life since the beginning of time. And when I read Siddhartha, a peace came over me. I felt a unity with all things living. The world, in spite of oppression, is a beautiful place. I would say, om, softly to myself, letting my lips vibrate. I felt the birds, the sun, and the trees. I was in communion with all the forces on the earth that truly love people, in communion with all the revolutionary forces on the earth. I was definitely getting better. They were unchaining me so that I could hobble to the bathroom every now and then with the help of the nurse. I was still weak, and when I returned from the bathroom, I would flop on the bed as if I had just accomplished a great physical feat. But at least now I knew what was wrong with me. During those first few days, I could barely ask, and when I did, they acted as if my condition were some top-secret information I was not privy to. I had three bullet holes. There was a bullet in my chest, it's still there, an injured lung with fluid in it, a broken clavicle, a paralyzed arm with undetermined damage to the nerves. I kept asking if I would be able to use my hand again. One or two doctors said flatly, no, the others said, maybe yes, maybe no. Anyway, I was going to live. Story. You died. I cried. 
and kept on getting up, a little slower and a lot more deadly. Context of white supremacy. We will be picking up on chapter two. It should be easy to follow no matter which version of the book you got. Picking up chapter two. If you would like to participate, the number to dial 760-569-7676. The code is 564-943-POUND. Press star six if you would like to participate. The number again, 760-569-7676. The code is 564-943-POUND. Press star six if you would like to participate. If you do not want to use the number, you can use the free flash phone. Uh, it works anywhere in the world. It is free. Uh, it's linked at the Black Talk Radio Network. If uh, you need the address, it is tiny, T I N Y dot C C forward slash. One race, and that is the number one. The address again, tiny, T-I-N-Y, dot C-C, forward slash, one race, and that is the number one. Uh, when you put that address in, click the link on the left of the page. Uh, you will be able to uh, get a new window, a uh, small window on your screen. Uh, it says free flash player, the link that you're clicking. Once you do that, the window on your screen, top line, it is a drop down menu. Select the number that I just gave out, which again is 760-569-7676. The next line, it will ask for the code. That code again is 564 nine four three and the final line it will ask for a name you can push random keys nickname if you're comfortable with your real name that's fine too uh, once you get all that entered click the green button it will connect you to the program same procedure if you would like to participate you'll see the dial pad on your screen press star six when you do so uh, you'll hear the audio prompt press the number one and we will get you on the air. With that, um, while we, I've read this book before, uh, but it has been a while since I read it, uh, I can only say again, this was a fabulous choice. I have hijacked the, uh, the book club. We haven't been, uh, voting. Uh, I've just kind of been picking stuff that I wanted to read, but I would say they have been some pretty good picks in my opinion. Anywho, uh, everyone who dialed in with a hand up, your line should be open. Feel free to uh, share thoughts, observations. May I be heard? Yes, sir. Well, this is, uh, God, first of all, greetings to all. Thanks, Gus. This, I, I got the book today, and I couldn't put it down. I canceled my appointments. And when this, when we're over, I'm going to go back to reading. It was just. It's just an amazing read. It feels like an intimate conversation, and vicariously, I'm there with her, uh, reminiscent of Man Child in the Promised Land, Richard Wright's Black Boy, even in some touches of Maya Angelou, uh, I Know Why Cage Bird Sing. I, I, I think it was a very, 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 del uh, it's a very, very delightful read. But more importantly, um, you know, this idea of, uh, of trying to get uh, people classify themselves as white for acceptance. I mean, since I've been listening to the Cows Network, um, you see what was happening to her in the in the, in the hospital room, and 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 there's a whole segment of society. If you if 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 they were to read this, the people classify themselves as white, they would think it's a fabrication. They don't realize this is a daily occurrence. And I think for me personally, um, this idea of trying to compare and say they did this. 
under a system of white supremacy racism, it's expected now. And so for me personally, in my own growth, I'm still confused, but less. I don't react as much anymore. I see because under a system of white supremacy, this is what I expect for them. The idea is to counter it and prepare for it and to be in the mindset for it. And I just want to say great, great, great choice. I look forward to the completion of this book. Thank you. Sure, for sure. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, greetings, Gus. Greetings to the other callers and the listeners. Uh, a great choice again. Uh, I've been meaning to read this book, but uh, never got around to it. I thought it was interesting that uh, the foreword is written by Angela Davis. You know, the people that are in support of. Uh, Ashada, Sakur, you know, leads you from the beginning to, you know, assume that she is a political prisoner rather than someone that has committed a crime. Uh, she was injured. Uh, she started off, she got right to the point. She told about what happened on that New Jersey turnpike when the she was injured herself and that the EMT kept asking her, kept asking the other one, is she dead yet? It's almost like they were waiting, you know, till she lost enough blood or to assist in her demise in some type of way. It was an act of racism from the start. And I think that her injuries that she sustained could not have allowed her to uh, do the crime that she was accused of doing and that at the hospital they allowed detectives to come into a room and interrogate her you know while she was probably still under uh painkillers and drugs but in a system of white supremacy you you have no rights you know you're in the hospital uh the detectives is in there grilling her and probably going to anything that she would say that she's not aware of would be used against her, you know, later on in a court of law. They started that good cop, bad cop strategy that is uh, basic with these race soldiers and that it is the beginning of a psychological conditioning that they are going to initiate upon what they consider a prisoner you know, in order to get some type of confession out of them in some type of way. I believe that that, that is why they were uh, poking her and actually uh, just violating her physical presence while they were questioning. And then uh, while she was talking, it was interesting that she used that they assumed that there was a carload of suspicious-looking colors in a white Ford coupe, but there was no suspicious-looking white people reported. And, of course, we know the cops terrorized Ms. Shakur while she was hospitalized, pointing a gun at her, you know, talking about Nazis and all this other crap. And then the only support, you know, that she had was a uh, black nurses that showed some sisterhood and codification and they provided uh, inspiration in the form of uh, black poems and a book on black women in America. I'll mute my line. Thanks for taking the call. Well, Mr. Demery, for um See any of the other folks that are with us uh, have comments uh, they wanted to share. Mine should be open. Can we hear? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm really disturbed by um, just hearing um, her version of it. Um, and 
and think at all the things that went down in Chicago and all these interrogations that the president himself will go through the trouble of placing her on the FBI most wanted list and her book is sitting out here and you know everything is already a part of um, the public record and to do all this and she has no time to even speak to a lawyer when she even requested a lawyer and he's a and the president is a constitutional lawyer that right there should let you know how much uh, uh, the Constitution is held up for black folks. That's why I always press everybody or anybody that calls themselves a lawyer, to, you know, always ask that question. Are black people citizens of the United States? Because if you are, there's some blatant violations going on and everything should be in question. You, you don't get a jury of your peers because if she's got an all-white jury, that, that there is no way you're going to say white people are equal to black people as though that's a peer. That's, that's bull. So I, I don't know. It's just, right now it's just uh, it's atrocious, but um. Sickening. Um, uh, I want to want to hear more. I, I didn't get a chance to hear um, how it all went down, but just I came in on the part where she's talking about how the police were treating her, and then she goes to the um to the arraignment. It sounds like where it's, you know the, the plea, the like plea. Um, but still, you know, you don't get a chance to even talk to your lawyer to even, and then when you do get a chance to talk to a lawyer, you don't get the privacy that you're supposed to get. Um, which means uh, there's, a, there's just blatant violations all around. I don't even really see how they can even have a, a war for arrest or even how, uh, how they can even maintain a guilty verdict um, with the shab job that they did as police officers. They, they screwed up their own case, which leads me to believe that um, that this was really no case to get go, and they were just going to frame the person and put him in jail. And that alone, uh, to me, deserves a presidential pardon. If we can uh, get black folks to quit being cowards for five minutes. If you're scared to die, then don't take the job. That's all I'm saying. I'll meet my line. <clears throat> Sounded like a bit of uh, anti-blackness in there. Uh, we do have a system, in my opinion, uh, if there is a system of terrorism uh, in place, uh, one of the results, the intended products of terrorism is to have people be fearful. So, did... Uh, it sound like a little bit of anti-blackness. I could maybe I didn't hear it correctly. In, in, in my defense, in my defense, I am a veteran of the United States military. If I can sign my name and pledge to protect this country against all threats, foreign and domestic, that means I ain't scared. If you're going to take the job, then don't be scared. That's all I'm saying. Okay, well, we veered off. We uh, veered off the topic a little bit, but uh, I would just re no uh, no disagreement with what you said. I would just reiterate: if if the system of racism, white supremacy, is terrorism against black people, one of the intended products is to have, particularly black people, be fearful. It almost sounded like what I was hearing from Masada Shakur. Uh, Sounded as if it was intended to intimidate and have her be fearful, but maybe I I didn't hear that correctly either. Uh, are there any other folks on the line who have not shared yet? Yes, sir. Greetings to everyone. Greetings. Uh, uh, accuse me of being a little bit strange, uh, but 
it sounded like the the reader the reader sounds like a white female. I mean, I, I could be wrong entirely, and if so, I apologize if if she isn't. <laughs> uh, but it sounds like a white female, which I it, and if it is, it sounds kind of kind of like funny that a white female is uh, reading the reading the uh, the book of uh, of uh, someone like uh, uh, Miss Shakur. Uh, to me, anyway. But uh, although I know that's very possible, I'm not going to let it uh, stop me from uh, learning something and, and, uh, and in turn learning is enjoying uh, to me. Uh, I've read the book uh, once before, but it was so long ago, it's, it's almost like uh, uh, by reading it again, by hearing the reading that, uh, that I'm going to get a lot out of it. Uh, it appears, correct me if I'm wrong. It appears that the uh, the book went right to the uh, the uh, shooting incident. Is that correct? Pretty much. That's yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, because I, I I didn't get on until about uh, some like eight thirty Eastern Standard Time. But uh, yes, uh, yeah, the uh, terroristic behavior out of uh, law enforcement, uh, especially, I think, under the circumstances that they are pretty much aware that the uh, person that they have in custody uh, has some sort of uh, organized thought uh, and or behavior uh, into what they're doing. Uh, by that time, uh, Ms. Shakur was a... Uh, a person who, in my estimation, was not confused about the system of racism and white supremacy. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, if anybody is is, is uh, thinking like I'm thinking that, you know, all all of the different uh, reactions he was having to the behavior that was exhibited upon her, uh, she was not surprised about it. That's why a lot a lot of cases she kept her mouth closed. Uh by that time uh the 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 uh the Black Panther Party was transitioning uh could be wrong but was transitioning over into other groups and uh people like herself had experiences in contact in terroristic contact uh with uh quote unquote law enforcement uh, in the areas where they were uh, working and organizing. And uh, she was to be behaving like a, a soldier behind enemy lines. That's exactly what it sounds like to me uh, in a hostile environment. And uh, and uh, the, the last thing that I would say is, uh, in my mind, all of that, all of that, that stress and and and, uh, and all of that pain that she was in, I think what 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 probably made it a little bit more uh, made her environment, her hostile environment, a little more comfortable. I know it would for me if 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 uh, one or both of my parents, I believe it was her her mother and sister, especially when the mother came in there and said, "I'm proud of you." Wow, that, that's that's huge. That's huge to me. That that is huge. Just to say those words, whatever whatever I'm going through at that particular point in time, it, it, it would it would lessen it a whole a whole lot psychologically, you know. Uh, because although she may have been had some experience with it, it still is a very hostile, very stressful environment, and uh, I can almost feel it, you know, from the from the reading itself. And, uh, it, and and from my experience of being in close proximity to law, law enforcement on a lot of calls, uh, that, that it reminded me of the behavior uh, by by hearing hearing that uh, the, the readings uh, to whereas they would they would bait you bait you and and with the idea in mind of you digging a, a big legal hole for yourself uh, and then oh by the way uh, let me read your rights. <laughs> 
you know, I, I, I would figure that, uh, you know, uh, with the, under the system of racism and white supremacy, it gives uh, some kind of uh, leeway that it doesn't have to be in a particular order. <laughs> or when you inform that person, you know, uh, of anything like that, of what particular order, that sort of thing. And uh, I'm pretty sure that happens on a daily basis uh, with non-white people, especially non-white black people uh, in this part of the world on a daily basis that that, that, that sort of thing happens. Uh, but like I said before, especially with, with her, I'm pretty sure uh, uh, law enforcement already knew or who they were. She wasn't by herself at the time, as I recall from the book, reading it the first time. She wasn't by herself. They they probably had been tailing them and trailing them for a while and and, and just waiting for just like you hunting uh you hunting, waiting for the quote unquote prey to uh to uh, uh you know, uh to get pounced on. And uh so those 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 are my observations of the uh of this first half. Of the reading. Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Uh, the narrator uh, has said uh, she is classified as non-white, FYI, for uh, listeners, and is a uh, cows listener. Uh, non-white cows listener. Um, okay. Call her at one uh, one six six four. You should be with us as well if you uh, had comments. Were you talking to me? Yes, Karma. Good evening, everyone. Um, I've only heard some YouTube with Ms. Shakur. I, I have not read her autobiography. But I thought this sounded kind of like her. I don't know. She has kind of like one of those sweet, you know, kind of girly voices. Even, even, I don't know, this, it sounded like her to me, but maybe I need to go back and look at it again. I was just so impressed. I was so impressed with her will to live. I am going to live. I am going to live because I could just see me in this situation becoming hopeless and saying, I give up. I'm going to transition now. I can't deal with this anymore. This is just way too much. I mean, she is just phenomenal. This is, I mean, her will to live is not, it's not. It's, it's not tapped down at all. I mean, it is, it is just, it is amazing. I mean, that, that, that is something else. And plus, she is, my sister once told me, she says, oh, I have to do something. And I'm like, what are you doing? She says, well, I have to make sure that my children have everything that they need internally so that they will not need anything from anyone in order to be okay every day. And she is so okay. She is so unapologetic. She has, I mean, she's just self-contained. And that she's just completely self-contained. And I just, that is so amazing to me. Um, I do think that, um, I do think that she, she deserves a presidential pardon. And, um, and you know, I, I don't know why she wouldn't get one, you know. I mean, for all reasons, being as the president is black, I, I, I wouldn't see why she wouldn't get one. Um. So I want to put my hat in for that. That she, everybody needs to say she needs a presidential pardon yesterday. Everybody needs to, to to just go ahead and let the president know he should have done that yesterday before he even brushed his teeth. And and as far as anti-blackness, I know you said it's off the subject, but you know I remember two thousand seasons. You know when when one of the the guys, you know, he's like, oh, you know, I'm missing my mama, I'm missing my daddy, you know, it's like. It's like, well, no one ever had a mama before except you, and no one ever had a daddy before except you, and I know you're just going to, like, I, you got to take care of yourself and your family because that's the most important thing. Of course, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. And and then, and, and you know, it's something that I struggle with here in my t- tiny little ball pond. But Ms. Shakur is, she is astounding. You know, she, I just can't get over her. She is a self-contained body, you know. It's just, I don't know. I, I guess I'm going on and on. I'm just so amazed. Hmm. I don't mind. I don't mind. Other folks have comments they want to get in. We have about 20 minutes before we get to the next audio segment. If you want to share before then, 
uh, comments I will make. Number one, so that we don't have any uh, suspense or build up. She does not go into detail about the prison break. Uh, so you can get that out of your mind uh, now. She does not go into detail. Uh, however, her aunt, who she has already mentioned, Evelyn Williams, uh, she also wrote a book. Her book is Inadmissible Evidence inadmissible evidence and she does go into detail about the details of the prison break uh you should probably read that book because it gives you a lot more detail about this case uh and if you read the description uh from black talk radio or the podcast if you're listening to the archives uh this asada was mentioned so many times like i i was already thinking back in january that this was the book i wanted to do after malcolm x and then the lead up um, I was trying to, you know, decide because there were other possibilities as well. Asada was mentioned so many times. It wasn't just with the Cuba thing. If folks who heard the students at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, the book, The Land Was Ours. Uh, he referenced both Asada's biography, autobiography, as well as Evelyn Williams, because Asada's grandparents owned land in North Carolina, beachfront property. And white people uh, get increasingly efficient at stealing property from black people. Uh, Evelyn Williams, in addition to uh, being an attorney for Asada Shakur, she also worked on behalf of uh, her grandparents to try to keep this land. But so many, so many mentions, I felt like it was uh, signals from the creator to do this book. Anywho, very important book. I remember reading it. It had a big uh, impact on getting me closer to uh, understanding the problem of racism. Uh, things that stood out. Um, I heard Asada Shakur today. Not well. I played her at the beginning of the program, and I was listening to her in a documentary uh, by Gil Noble. And uh, I thought the narrator did sound a bit like her as well. Karma I'm, would be in agreement with Karma on that one. Uh, but one of the things that she said that stuck out that resonates, I think, I have a sound clip that says, "If anyone is ignorant about racism, it's black people." She said that they didn't understand the level of the attack against them and the them was the Black Panther Party, uh, the Black Liberation Army, black people, period, and uh, specifically black people that were working against racism in the 60s and 70s. She said, we just didn't we just didn't understand the depth of the assault against us and creating so many problems uh, for us and hunting us, even killing uh, members, uh, black people at this period in time. And I just, I think that's so important because, and this was even stressed, uh, in, uh, Nathan Connolly's book, the last couple of weeks, uh, a world more concrete. Uh, he said that there is a huge gap in information, uh, between racists and black people. That is a part of of the imbalance of power, uh, that they just have a lot more information. It's not that white people are ignorant. That's not the problem at all. And she reiterated that. Uh, also, she talked about them disrupting her sleep, and they just had a great presentation on uh, Talk Radio 702 in South Africa about uh, things you can do to restore your sleep. I know myself and so many victims uh, have pro they, there's a report that came out uh, within the last two, three years about how racism disrupts the sleep of black people. Um, just one of the other ways, the symptoms of this problem. Uh, but it also reminded me of James Meredith uh, at Ole Miss. Um, they organized. This is in a documentary where a white man says that he and other racists that they would take turns to bounce a basketball over James Meredith, who uh, was the first black student at Ole Miss in Mississippi, to bounce a basketball over his head like 24 seven to disrupt him so that he couldn't sleep, couldn't study, couldn't have peace and quiet. It's just the, the pathology of whites on display again. Um, World War II, I say that when Dr. Welsing, when she comes on and she says the importance of studying Nazi Germany, I would just expand that to World War II. World War II had such a huge impact uh, in terms of racism, white supremacy, and so many different things that you can study. Uh, the comments that she was saying, that she was hearing from these officers about saying that uh, this guy who said he fought on the wrong side in World War II, and if Hitler had remained in power, niggers like her wouldn't be running around killing cops. Uh, and that was common. Uh, to have white people with that sort of sentiment. Uh, we discussed the book talking about uh, the impact of production 
uh, during World War II, the impact, how World War II impacted production uh, and the labor racism that was encountered by black female and male workers where white people were saying the exact same thing in Michigan documented that, you know, I would rather see Hitler in power than have a nigger be promoted and working on this job. Widespread. Uh, Evelyn Williams, definitely make sure you check out her book. Um, it just FYI for people who are following along. Um, she does not capitalize her eyes. I don't know what that's about. If folks have a theory, you can share, but she does not capitalize her, uh, eyes as in, uh, I am going to the store, um, unless they're at the beginning of a sentence. Um, she's all of this is set in uh, New Jersey, where this shooting happens, and the tactics that she talked about about black people being stopped and all of that. Newark, the Newark Police Department, they just got a DOJ report, like I think days before Eric Garner was choked to death. I know that was in New York, but I'm just you know, to give some context to when this happened before everything broke Newark, New Jersey police department. They just had a big report. We talked about it on the program. Uh, last year, we had a white professor on from, uh, Rutgers, uh, in New Jersey, uh, as well as they just, it's been getting a lot of attention, uh, in New Jersey that there was a black male. Uh, the police pulled this guy over, they beat him unconscious and then let the dog, uh, chew on him. This is getting a lot of attention and, Quite a few things. Doug Christie's uh, great state of New Jersey. Um, let's see what else did I have? Uh, the, her treatment in the hospital. It just it reminded me of Henrietta Lacks, right? Even though I know that's in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, she doesn't trust the black nurse. I thought that was important, and she doesn't uh, go in name calling her and saying she's a Tom and all this. And when she's just coming in that trying to get her name the first time, but she doesn't trust her, and I think that that is just being codified. That's what the system of white supremacy is. I understand the power dynamics that white people, they can exert a lot of pressure. I mean, she's experiencing it firsthand. She knows they could be doing the same thing to this black nurse. So it's not, I didn't get that, you know, y'all can let me know, but I didn't get a sense of her having any uh, venom towards this nurse. As, as Carmen was saying, she was self-contained, just was, hey, I don't think this would be in my best interest to uh, trust this person. And then when she was ready to try to reach out and get help, she went with the black nurse, uh, only with what she trusted to give her to. I think that essence of codification and figuring out the best way to try to solve problems without creating new problems and how you view white people and victims of white supremacy. Um, the sentence where she said, this is very early on in the book, where she said the hospital is glaring white. I wasn't sure what she was talking about. And then the next sentence, she says, uh, it was people she was talking about, but just the connection, the the, the connotations of the term white uh, with because, uh, I mean, a lot of times people do comment about hospitals being white. A lot of times they're painted white and, and everybody's wearing white. The doctor's coat is white. A lot of the times the brightness, they tend to have uh, be well lit areas and uh, associating white with cleanliness and a lot of other things. It was just a lot of associations in my mind, the way that sentence uh, was so abrupt the hospital is glaring white words um i will end just leaving her laying in the gutter it reminded me of michael brown jr uh black bodies being left in the street symbolically uh deliberately purposely um yeah i will i will stop there uh folks have anything else they want to share we have about 12 minutes left if anybody uh, hasn't been able to share, feel free, get a hand up, star six. Any of the other folks who have a hand up already, your line should be open. Yes. Uh, it's two, two more things. Uh, first, uh, I think the timing for the book was, was right on the mark uh, because Minister Malcolm to a lot of uh, young people during that time uh, was kind of like a, um, I don't know if the word is pioneer, but like a precursor to some of their ideas and what they wanted to, uh, to, uh, to, to do as far as organizing, uh, with the idea of, uh, uh, attempting to counter against the system of racist white supremacy, uh, uh, such as the Black Panther Party, uh, they uh, not so much for the for uh, in connection with uh, Minister Malcolm as as far as religion is concerned, but 
more or less the uh, political understanding. And, and at the, and within the last months of Minister Malcolm's death, he was being courted very heavily uh, by the uh, Socialist Party. Uh, he made several speeches. Uh, I think it was in New York, wherever, wherever one of the central uh, headquarters he made speeches and and mentioned in one of his speeches that any time they would ask him to come come in, he would. Uh, not saying that that was something that he was definitely was going to uh, buy into as he lived, but nevertheless, uh, and we all know that the uh, Black Panther Party had connections with uh, uh, socialism. Matter of fact, they used to sell the Red Book uh, in order to raise, in order to raise money. Uh, uh, also, uh, the uh, they gave they gave a, a connection between uh, the Nazi Party, their uniforms, and uh, I think New Jersey police. I was I was in that area a few months ago, and and they are that whoever was doing that described description is very accurate. Because uh, I I remember going to a restaurant uh, 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 that was across the street from this hotel that I was staying at to get something to go. And all of these enforcement officials, white enforcement officials over there, and it, it looked just like uh, a Berlin, Germany uh, during the 1940s uh, with the, the same type of caps on the head, jack boots, shiny jack boots, uh, the, 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 the uh, jockey uh, like pants, and, and these wasn't even motorcycle police officers. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, that that, that was a, 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 you know very accurate on what they was talking about. Because yeah, I had saw pictures prior to me visiting that area. I saw pictures of uh, New Jersey uh, uh, police, and uh, I was always uh, 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 observant of that. And the book uh, made a made a good uh, connection there. That was it. Before I get to uh, 5098, or if anybody else had comments, uh, the book uh, that was referenced, uh, it is Black Women in White America. <laughs> Make sure we get the title correct. Black Women in White America, a documentary history uh, by Gerda, Gerda Lerner. Gerda Lerner, Black Women in White America. Uh, and uh, it was published, it looks like, in 19... Uh, well, it had to be out. A while before that, uh, but you can get. Uh, it looks like you can get a, a pretty uh, inexpensive copy uh, online. Won't run you too many dollars if you want to check it out. I might try and uh, nab a copy of it myself. Black women in white America. Uh, other folks have comments. Yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Okay, I'd like to comment on the part of the book where she said that they really did think black people were stupid. But you know, the tactic that they were using was coming in there and said, give her a few facts concerning the, you know, the likes or dislikes of the codependent co or codependent, and then say that they're turning over on you. So you might as well go ahead and tell us what they did, you know, playing one against the other. And she was sharp enough to realize that that was one of the tactics that the law enforcement agency was using. And I thought that was codified, and I thought that was worth mentioning. And she said at the end that divide and conquer has always been their motto. I move my mind. Mm -hmm. Worth highlighting, in my opinion, illustration of... Uh highly codified black person, highly codified black female, in my opinion, uh, because sometimes the best, the most codified thing to do is to not say anything, which it seemed like she was doing a lot of just that. Just don't say anything at all until you have figured out, you know, what exactly is going to work in your interest. And even, even when she does speak, she asks a question when they're given their Nazi rant, she doesn't curse them out or go on a tirade. She asks, are there many Nazis on the, uh, 
police force. But yeah, excellent uh, illustration all the way through uh, of just being very uh, codified in how she's carrying herself, how she's talking, her use of word and words. Man, that's going to come a big time in the book as we proceed. Uh, 5098, did you have something you wanted to get in? Yeah, I, I, what I mean, it was something what the other caller said, and we're talking about the Nazi connection. Remember, Charles Lindbergh was a Nazi sympathizer, and I believe the only king to abdicate his throne, he married the American Mrs. Simpson. He also was a Nazi sympathizer. Prescott Bush, of course, you know that relationship, too. So, And those sentiments were, uh, and in New Jersey, I believe they had like the Boy Scouts and other little that were modeled after the Hitler Youth. So that was going on. And one other comment I wanted to make, but something just came to mind. I, I, I seen them. I, I, I didn't read the book, but I watched a movie called The Motorcycle Diaries. And it's kind of shaped Che Guevara. And I sort of relate to this. I don't want to go ahead. I've kind of gone ahead in the book. But the circumstances kind of shaped her views. And all of our views, as far as that go, who, who's on the Cal's network that I hear. And, and, and this idea that she was a soldier, and that she is a soldier, and so there's a certain code of behavior. You know, like what they teach you in the military that says you only give your name, rank, and serial number, that type of thing. And so I, I just really, I mean, she, just her strength, um, um, her ability to be able to evaluate and critique her situation and give the appropriate response, and that's all I had. Thanks. Any other comments? We got about three minutes and change before we get to the next audio segment. Any other comments? Um, may, may, may I? Hello? Um, I'd like to add that I did ask why I did. I have heard that all of the white people in Texas they say about 95% of them claim German ancestry. And I did ask a white person that. And he said, yeah, that's about right. And I said, and a lot of them are from the the um, German prisoners of war right after World War II. A lot of the German ancestry is from German prisoners of war, right? And he said, yeah, that's true. They just let all of the German prisoners of war go in Texas. And I and I, now I know that the reason we have so many problems is not because is because we have a lot of Nazis. Texas has a lot of Nazis. I mean it's just all of these people around here, I had wondered what was wrong with them. They're all the children and grandchildren of Nazis. And I think that may be in a lot of little enclaves around the United States. But for Texas it is very true. These white people here are not they are just Nazis. They, they are escaped prisoners of war who were let go after after World War II was over. So. Uh, yes, Jess, can I make a comment? Two minutes. Two minutes. Choose to answer or not to answer, but I'm just wondering if there's a uh, uh, similarity or if these two individuals are the same. There was uh, an individual from another book, I think it was Dark End of the Street, where there was a Joanne who uh, used an ice pick. And I was just wondering if this is the same Joanne. That's spoiler alert. Oh, no, these are, are two different uh, people. That's, uh, I don't even think her name is pronounced the same. Uh, I think it's Joan uh, Little. Joan Little is who you're talking about. Uh, black female uh, in... I believe North Carolina might be, I might have the incorrect Carolina, but she was uh, in confinement and uh, a white enforcement officer attempted to rape her and she ended up killing him with an ice pick. She was uh, exonerated, self-defense, uh, but that's uh, not the same person. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, right on. We yeah, about 30 seconds before we get to the next uh, audio segment. Yeah, this is uh, such a great book. Uh, and even with the uh, commentary about the police, all of that sounded uh, just <laughs> like I've heard that before and recently. Uh, I guess I will say this before we get in. I, I strongly submit it's connected to what I said about uh, what Asada Shakur herself said that she was not aware 
She was not adequately informed about what race, what racism, white supremacy is and how it works, which is what I contend is a big problem. We just drastically underestimate what we're talking about, the nature of the threat, the attack, the war against black people. And I strongly assert that it is not that white people are uninformed about this. I have met a lot of white people who have read this book like thoroughly highlighted the whole nine many white people this book is widely available on predominantly white campuses they study this book it's not that they don't know it's that they support the system of white supremacy and police terrorism like what she experienced tamir rice rakia boyd that is one aspect of many in the system of white terrorism we will get to the second audio segment, chapter two, uh, Asada, an autobiography, context of white supremacy. Chapter two. The FBI cannot find any evidence that I was born. On my FBI wanted poster, they list my birth date as July 16th, 1947, and in parenthesis, not substantiated by birth records. Anyway, I was born... I am the older of two children. My sister Beverly was born five years later. The name my mama gave me was Joanne Deborah Byron. I am told that I was a fat, happy baby and that I was talking in complete sentences when I was about nine months old. They say that I was lazy, though, that I talked way before I learned to walk. Everybody says that I had my days mixed up with my nights and kept everybody up all night. I'm still pretty much a night owl. The only other tale I remember hearing about my babyhood was that I would scream at the top of my lungs whenever anybody wearing furs or feathers came near me. I'm still not too fond of furs and feathers. My mother and father were divorced shortly after I was born. I lived with my mother, my aunt, now Evelyn Williams, my grandmother, Lulu Hill, and my grandfather, Frank Hill, in a house in the Bricktown section of Jamaica, New York. The only thing I remember about that house is the backyard, which I loved, and the huge dog next door. I remember the dog well because he terrified me. To my young eyes, he looked like a giant, a canine version of King Kong or Mighty Joe Young. I'm still not too wild about dogs. When I was three years old, my grandparents sold the house and moved down south. I moved with them. We moved into a big wooden house on 7th Street in Wilmington, North Carolina. It was the house my grandfather had grown up in. It had a wraparound porch with a big green swing and, of course, rose bushes in the front yard and a pecan tree in the back. My grandfather originally thought that the house belonged to my great-grandfather, Papa Link, short for Lincoln, but they found out he had only been given use of the house for his lifetime. Papa Link had worked as a chauffeur for one of the most prominent white families in Wilmington, and, the story goes, had been a prominent member of the black community. He and my great-grandmother, Mama Jessie, had worked all their lives, had raised 11 children in that house, and had died under the impression that the house was theirs. Fine print and white lawyers have a way of robbing black people of what is theirs. My grandparents were forced to buy the house again. Who's better than you? Nobody. Who? Nobody? Get that head up. Yes. Yes, who? Yes, Grandmommy. I want that head held up high, and I don't want you taking no mess from anybody, you understand? Yes, Grandmommy. Don't you let me hear about anybody walking over my grandbaby. No, Grandmommy. I don't want nobody taking advantage of you, you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Yes, who? Yes, Grandmommy. All of my family tried to instill in me a sense of personal dignity, but my grandmother and my grandfather were really fanatic about it. Over and over they would tell me, you're as good as anyone else. Don't let anybody tell you that they're better than you. My grandparents strictly forbade me to say, yes ma'am and yes sir, or to look down at my shoes or to make subservient gestures when talking to white people. You look them in the eye when you talk to them, I was told. And speak up like you got some sense. I was told to speak in a loud, clear voice and to hold my head up high or risk having my grandparents knock it off my shoulders. 
My grandparents were big on respect. I was to be polite and respectful to adults, to say good morning or good evening as I passed the neighbors' houses. Any kind of back talk or sass was simply out of the question. My grandparents didn't even permit me to answer questions with a simple yes or no. Instead, I had to say, yes, grandmother, or no, grandfather. But when it came to dealing with white people in the segregated South, my grandmother would tell me menacingly, don't you respect nobody that don't respect you. You hear me? Yes, grandmother. I would answer, my voice almost a whisper. Speak up, she would tell me repeatedly, something she seemed hell-bent on making me do. She would send me to the store with clear instructions on what to bring back. I was under no circumstances to come home with inferior goods, something which happened all too often to black people in the South. You tell them that you don't want any garbage, and you better not come back with any, she would warn me. If the store owner sold me something that my grandmother didn't like, I would have to return to the store and get the thing changed or get my money back. You speak up loud and clear. Don't let me have to go down to that store. Scared to death of the fuss my grandmother would make if she had to go to the store herself, I would hurry back to the store, prepared to raise almighty hell. Whenever my grandmother heard about somebody being mistreated, especially if it was a man mistreating a woman, she would glare at me and say, Don't you let anybody mistreat you, you hear? We're not raising you up to be mistreated, you hear? I don't want you taking no mess off nobody, you understand? Yes, grandmother, I would answer for what seemed like the millionth time, wondering why my grandmother liked to repeat herself so often. The tactics that my grandparents used were crude, and I hated it when they would repeat everything so often. But the lessons that they taught me more than anything else I learned in life helped me to deal with things I would face growing up in America. But a lot of times, for my grandparents, pride and dignity were hooked up to things like position and money. For them, being just as good as white people meant having what white people had. They would tell me to go to school and study so that I could have a nice house and nice clothes and a nice car. White people don't want to see us with nothing, they would tell me. That's why you've got to get your education, so that you can be somebody and have something in life. Becoming somebody in life just didn't mean too much to me. I wanted to feel happy, to feel good. My awareness of class differences in the black community came at an early age. Although my grandmother taught me more about being proud and strong than anyone I know, she had a lot of Booker T. Washington pull-yourself-up-by-the-bootstraps talented 10th ideas. She had worked hard and had made a decent living as a peace worker in a factory, but she had other ideas for me. She was determined that I would become part of Wilmington's talented 10th, the privileged class, part of the so-called black bourgeoisie. One of her first steps was to sternly forbid me to play with alley rats. It was impossible for me to obey her orders since I had absolutely no idea what an alley rat was. I often became the unwitting object of my grandmother's fury, charged with the crime of alley rat playing. My grandmother, writhing with annoyance, would threaten me with untold punishments if I continued my evil ways. I received strict orders to abandon my penchant for alley rats and play with decent children. But we can never agree on who decent children were. Decent children, to my grandmother, were a whole nother story. Decent children came from decent families. How did you know what a decent family was? A decent family lived in a decent house. How did you know what a decent house was? A decent house was fixed up nice and had a sidewalk in front of it. Decent families didn't let their kids play in the street with no shoes on, and didn't let their kids say, ain't. Little did my grandmother know that ain't was my favorite word once I got two feet out of her hearing range. My grandmother had a little alley rat right under her roof and she didn't even know it. Alley rats supposedly lived in alleys and run-down shacks, but my grandmother would often call one of my friends an alley rat, even if the kid didn't live in an alley. Dutifully, to put some sense in my head, she would take me to visit decent children. These decent little souls were invariably the offspring of Wilmington's black doctors, lawyers, preachers, and undertakers. School teachers, barbershop owners, and the editor of the colored newspaper were also decent. In most of these decent little play sessions, the other kids and I would stand around looking at each other awkwardly. Sometimes we would get it on and have some fun, but more often than not, 
it would be glare at each other time or show and tell time. The kids showing me their toys and such while grown-ups oohed and odd. The worst times were eating at the preacher's house, where they would take an hour saying grace, or playing ball with the undertaker's daughter. She always wanted to play ball, and I was scared to death that the ball was going to roll into the part where they kept the dead people and end up in the mouth of some corpse. My grandmother would have caught a shit fit if she had known that one of her favorite little decent kids' favorite game was playing show-and-tell with his dingling and threatening to pee on everybody. After these visits, my grandmother would chirp for a week about how nice my little decent friends were and about how nicely we had played together, while I would groan silently and keep the expression on my face one shade away from insolence. My grandmother and I waged a standoff battle damn near until I was grown. It wasn't that I wanted to defy her. It was that I just liked who I liked. I didn't care what kind of house my friends had or whether or not they lived in alleys. All that mattered was whether I liked them. I was convinced then, and I'm still convinced, that in some things, kids have a lot more sense than adults. But, to my young mind, life in Wilmington was exciting. There were always new places to go, and new cousins, aunts, and uncles to meet. One of my favorite relatives was Aunt Lou. She was Mama Jessie's sister, and she lived across town. She was my grandfather's only remaining relative in Wilmington. The rest had moved up north or out west. Aunt Lou had a magic house, full of all kinds of flavors, textures, smells, and things. There were whole worlds in her house to explore. She would always feed me something good to eat and then let me run wild. I didn't know until I was grown that Aunt Lou had a son. His name was Uncle Willie, and he died before I was born. Uncle Willie was something of a legend around Wilmington during the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Whenever he came to town, they say Aunt Lou would plead and moan and worry until he was in safer territory up north. They say that he would tear down the colored and white-only signs and break the Jim Crow laws at whim. He would go around demanding his rights and denouncing the oppression of black people, and it is logical that no one who loved him felt the least bit comfortable until he was gone. They called him Wild Willie, or That Crazy Indian. He was supposedly black and Cherokee but people called him that because of his nature. They say he had a lot of friends and that he died of natural causes. The rest of the relatives I met came from my grandmother's side. My grandmother's family lived in Seabreeze, outside of Wilmington, close to Carolina Beach. Their last name was Freeman, and they were famous for being high-strung, quick-tempered, and emotional. They seldom worked for anybody, choosing instead to live on the land their father had left them. They worked as farmers and fishermen, and they owned small stores. I have also heard that they were in the bootleg business. My grandmother's father was a Cherokee Indian. He died when my grandmother was very young. Nobody knows too much about him except that, somehow, he acquired a great deal of land and left it to his children. The land was very valuable because much of it bordered either on the river or on the ocean. Everybody had a different theory about what my great-grandfather had done to acquire it, but it was because of this land that my grandparents had moved down south. In 1950, the year we moved to Wilmington, the south was completely segregated. Black people were forbidden to go to many places, and that included the beach. Sometimes they would travel all the way to South Carolina just to see the ocean. My grandparents decided to open a business on their land. It consisted of a restaurant, lockers where people could change clothes, and an area for dancing and hanging out. The popular name for the beach was Bop City, although my grandparents insisted on calling it Freeman's Beach. Throughout my childhood, the name Freeman had no particular significance. It was a name just like any other name. It wasn't until I was grown and began to read black history that I discovered the significance of the name. After slavery, many black people refused to use the last names of their masters. They called themselves Freeman instead. The name was also used by Africans who were freed before slavery was officially abolished, but it was mainly after the abolition of chattel slavery that many black people changed their names to Freeman. After learning this, I saw my ancestors in a new light. For me, the beach was a wonderful place, and to this day, there is no place on this earth that I love more. I have never seen a beach more beautiful than it was then, before they decided to build a canal right through the property of my grandparents. It is now just a pale shadow of what it used to be, most of it destroyed by erosion. 
but back then there were majestic sand dunes covered with tall seagrass where my cousins and I would build forts, houses, and sometimes cities. When time permitted, we spent hours hiding and making sneak attacks on one another. The sand was fine and clean, and in the beginning of summer we could find just about every imaginable kind of seashell. When the sun got too hot, we would sit in the old blue jeep my grandfather drove and play with frilly things like paper dolls and teacups. After I learned to read, I would sit in the sun under the huge hats my grandmother always made me wear and read one book after another. Every other week, my grandfather went to the colored library on Red Cross Street, and the librarian would send ten or so books for me to read. As soon as I finished reading them, my grandfather would go and get another batch. My imagination was vivid. With fragments of pirates and the Bobsy twins floating around, I would sit looking out at the ocean and think about everything. I imagined all the places I had read about on the other side of the ocean and wondered if I would ever see them. And, of course, I daydreamed about all kinds of stuff. Most of it silly. But my days were not spent simply daydreaming. My grandparents were firm believers in work. They had worked all of their lives, and there was no way they were going to tolerate any lazy good-for-nothings around them. Every day, there were chores to do, and there was no playing until they were completed. I did things like putting the potato chips on the racks, putting sodas in the cooler, wiping the tables clean, etc. When customers were there, I would sell small stuff like potato chips, nabs, pickles, and pickled pig's feet. I would also set the tables and bring customers things they needed. But my main job was collecting 50 cents for parking. Because there was no road to our beach, the paved road ended with the white section, my grandparents had to pay for a dirt road and a parking lot to be laid over the sand. Truckloads of dirt were brought, and a steamroller smashed it down so that it was hard enough to drive on. This was an expensive process, so my grandparents decided to charge 50 cents for parking. I could count and make change at a very early age, so it was my job to collect the 50 cents. During the week, it wasn't too time-consuming, but on the weekends when the weather was nice, it was an all-day job. Cars and buses of people came from all over North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. There were church groups, school groups, social clubs, women's clubs, Boy Scouts, and Girl Scouts. All kinds of people would come to the beach, some with a little money, and some that you could tell were real poor. In all the years I spent on that beach, only one or two people hassled me. Most of them treated me very kindly, just like I was their kid. The people who came to the beach fascinated me. I loved to see them come and go. After a while, I would recognize the regulars, and it didn't take me too long to learn their names. Some of them gave me tips, which I usually spent on the piccolo, jukebox. There were lots of lovers, and I spent my time spying on them in the parking lot, but they weren't too interesting. All they did was squirm a lot. Checking license plates, I could recognize almost all of the state's license plates on site, and collecting bugs, I had a huge collection, were much more interesting. But watching families was better, on their picnics with their fried chicken, potato salads, and watermelon. Some of them looked so happy, you could tell they didn't get a chance to go to many picnics. And I was always on the watch for kids to play with when I wasn't busy. Then there were the good timers. Their cars smelled like whiskey. They would dance a lot, eat a lot, spend a lot on the piccolo, and many times I would wonder if they had made it home all right. A lot of poor people came to the beach. Sometimes the floors of their raggedy old cars and trucks were half rotted out. Usually a lot of little children were with them, and they wouldn't have bathing suits. They went swimming in whatever clothes they had worn to the beach, and half the time the little kids wore nothing. Then there were those who came to put on airs, usually in the evening, all dressed up to eat dinner. Many would say, I can't stand the sun. I'm too black already. I ain't going out in no sun. It was amazing the number of people who said they were too black already. We looked at them like they were crazy because we love the sun. But the umbrellas were... But the umbrellas for rent went like hotcakes. Some people draped clothes and blankets around the umbrella so that no light penetrated whatsoever. One lady always put a paper bag on her head and poked holes in it for eyes. Some of the women refused to go near the water because they were afraid their hair would go bad.
One of the moving things for me was when someone saw the ocean for the first time. It was amazing to watch. They would stand there in awe, overpowered and overwhelmed, as if they had come face to face with God or with the vastness of the universe. I remember one time a preacher brought an old lady to the beach. She was the oldest looking person I had ever seen. She said that she just wanted to see the ocean before she died. She stood there in one spot for so long she looked like she was in a trance. Then, with the help of the preacher, she hobbled around, picked up mundane shells, and put them into her handkerchief, as if they were the most precious things in the world. I love to eat, still do, and the beach was right up my alley. Right now, when I think of the fried chicken and fish dinners, my mouth starts to water. But what really sets me off is remembering those seafood platters with fish, shrimps, oysters, deviled crab, clam fritters, and french fries with lettuce and tomatoes on the side. If my memory is any good, I think they sold for a dollar fifty. Next to food, music was my love. Fats Domino, Nat King Cole, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, The Platters... Brooke Benton, Bobby Blue Bland, James Brown, Dinah Washington, Maxine Brown, Big Mabel were some of the people I listened to during those beach years. I loved to dance. They would play that music and I would dance my natural heart out. That was another way I collected tips. People would egg me on. Go on, gal, go. Boy, look at that girl dance. But I love to see people dance, too. Many a time, my grandmother or grandfather had to call me out of the trance I was in watching somebody dance instead of doing my chores. At night, my cousins, who sometimes came over to work on the beach, told ghost stories. They loved to tell them to me because I would get scared out of my wits. They would tell me about people who came back from the dead, about snakes that could crawl a hundred miles an hour and beat you to death with their tails, and about red phantoms and haints and all kinds of other horrible things. My imagination was vivid, and before the night was over, the seagrass turned to monsters and the wind made ghost howls. Sometimes, even my grandmother and grandfather would get into the ghost story sessions. My grandfather's favorite one goes like this. He was driving home in a terrible storm one night. It was lightning and thundering like crazy. He saw lightning hit a tree ahead of him and saw the tree fall across the road. He tried to stop, but it was too late. He braced himself to hit the tree, but nothing happened. The car went smoothly through as if it weren't there. He turned around, and sure enough, the tree was still lying across the road. He swears that the story is true, and I'm convinced that he thoroughly believes it is. We were, however, visited by real, live ghosts. They were the phantoms of the parking lot. It seems that the white citizens of Wilmington and Carolina Beach were not at all happy that my grandparents had dared to build on the land and to start a colored business. We were too close for their comfort, so they would visit us from time to time to express their disapproval. I don't know for a fact that they were card-carrying members of the Klan, but judging from their behavior, I think they were. But then, of course, they weren't wearing their sheets. They could have just been red-blooded American boys out for some good, clean fun. The parking lot was made of dirt, and cars spinning around on it at breakneck speed would ruin it in no time. Two or three of them would ride across the parking lot, spinning and skidding, while they shouted curses and racist insults. One time, they fired guns in the air. I remember seeing them and hearing them out there and wondering what they were going to do next. More than once, I saw my grandfather go to where he kept his gun and carry it quietly to where he had been sitting. Somehow, this made me more afraid, because I knew that he, too, thought they were scary. Finally, my grandfather put a big, fat chain, almost as big as the kind used to anchor ships, across the road at the entrance to the parking lot. This soon eliminated our nightly visitors. One night, as my grandmother and I were fastening the chain in place and locking it, A white man drove up to the lot and, in an arrogant tone of voice, ordered my grandmother to open the gate so that he could turn his car around. My grandmother, looking very dignified, said, No, I can't let you do that. Then, in a nicer voice, he asked my grandmother again to open the gate. No, she said again. Come on now, auntie, I got a mammy in my house. Now open the gate and let me turn around. What do you say? asked my grandmother. 
I said I got a mammy in my house. Now come on, open up. My grandmother leaned over in the man's face. I don't care how many mammies you got in your house. I don't care if you got a hundred mammies in your house. You're going to back out of here tonight. And I want you off my property now. Right now. That man turned as red as a redneck can turn and started to back his car up. The road was very narrow, barely wide enough for one car, and there was no way he could turn around without getting stuck in the sand. He backed up for more than a quarter of a mile. As we looked at him backing up, my grandmother and I laughed so hard the tears fell from our eyes. Every day, when we drove from the house on 7th Street to the beach, we passed a beautiful park with a zoo. Every day, I would beg, plead, whine, and nag my grandmother to take me to the zoo. It was almost an obsession. She would always say that one day she would take me, but one day never came. I would sit in the car, pouting, thinking about how mean she was. I thought that she had to be the meanest woman on the face of the earth. Finally, with the strangest look on her face, she told me that we were not allowed in the zoo, because we were black. When we were on the beach, we shopped at Carolina Beach. It had an amusement park, but of course black people were not permitted to go in. Every time we passed it, I looked at the merry-go-round and the Ferris wheel and the little cars and airplanes, and my heart would just long to ride them. But my favorite forbidden ride had the little boats in a pool of water, and every time I passed them, I felt frustrated and deprived. Of course, persistent creature that I am, I always asked to be taken on the rides, knowing full well what the answer would be. One summer, my mother and sister and I were walking down the boardwalk. My mother was spending part of her summer helping my grandparents in the business. As soon as we neared the rides, I went into my usual act. I continued, ad nauseum, until my mother, grinning, said, All right now, I'm going to try to get us in. When we get over there, I don't want to hear one word out of either of you. Just let me do the talking, and if they ask you anything, don't answer, okay? Okay. My mother went over to the ticket booth and began talking. I didn't understand a word she was saying. The lady at the ticket window kept telling my mother that she couldn't sell her any tickets. My mother kept talking, very fast, and waving her hands. The manager came over and told my mother she couldn't buy any tickets and that we couldn't go into the park. My mother kept talking and waving her hands, and soon she was screaming in this foreign language. I didn't know if she was speaking a play language or a real one. Several other men came over. They talked to my mother. She continued. After the men went to one side and had a conference, they returned and told the ticket seller to give my mother the tickets. I couldn't believe it. All at once, we were laughing and giggling and riding the rides. All the white people were staring at us, but we didn't care. We were busy having a ball. When I got into one of those little boats, my mother practically had to drag me out. I was in my glory. When we finished the ride, we went to the Dairy Queen for ice cream. We sang and laughed all the way home. When we got home, my mother explained that she had been speaking Spanish and had told the managers that she was from a Spanish country and that if he didn't let us in, she would call the embassy and the United Nations and I don't know who all else. We laughed and talked about it for days, but it was a lesson I never forgot. Anybody, no matter who they were, could come right off the boat and get more rights and respect than American-born blacks. My first school experience was Mrs. Perkins School in Wilmington. It was a little two-room school on Red Cross Street where I learned the fundamentals of reading, writing, and arithmetic. I was four years old. Mrs. Perkins School was the closest thing to a nursery school that black people in Wilmington had, but she didn't play that baby stuff. We were there to learn. I was prone to colds, however, and I guess the pot-bellied stove in the school didn't give off enough heat. I was out sick more than I was in school. But I learned enough so that when I went to first grade, everything was easy. I could already read. I spent most of first grade in New York with my mother, the rest of the first and all of the second down south with my grandparents. I went to Gregory Elementary School in Wilmington. My teachers knew my grandparents well and gave them daily reports of my progress. The teachers were strict and believed solemnly in the paddle, but we learned. Of course, our school was segregated, but the teachers took more of an interest in our lives because they lived in our world, in the same neighborhoods. 
They knew what we were up against and what we would be facing as adults, and they tried to protect us as much as they could. More than once, we were punished because some children had made fun of a student who was poor and badly dressed. I'm not saying that segregation was a good system. Our schools were inferior. The books were used and torn, handed down from white schools. We received only a fraction of the state money allotted to white schools, and the conditions under which many black children received an education can only be described as horrible. But black children encountered support and understanding and encouragement instead of the hostile indifference they often met in the integrated schools. There was a big dirt yard next to the school where we would play and fight. We grew up fighting. It was really hard to get through school without a few fights, just to survive. But I always wondered what made people fight, especially after we learned about wars. I used to look out on the remains of the sunken ship that tilted up in front of our beach and wondered how people died in it. It was covered with green moss, and I imagined skeletons floating around inside. The ship had been sunk during the Civil War, and I always wondered if it carried Northerners or Southerners. Back in those days, I used to think that Northerners were the good guys. But I could never make much sense out of war. I remember being taught that World War I was the war to end all wars. Well, we know that was a lie because there was World War II. I remember a teacher telling us that World War I was started because Prince Ferdinand, somewhere in Austria, got killed. When we learned history, we were never taught the real reasons for things. We were just taught useless trivia, simplistic facts, key phrases, and miscellaneous, meaningless dates. I couldn't understand it. What were people all the way in America doing in a war because some prince got killed in Austria? I could just imagine going home and telling my grandmother that I got into a fight because some dude in Europe got killed. They made war sound so glorious in school, so heroic. But the wars we had on the way home from school and in the playground were anything but glorious. Besides the cuts and scratches we received on our battleground, we were likely to get spanked for fighting or for getting our clothes dirty. I was pretty lucky in that respect. When my grandmother would discover that I was all in one piece, she wouldn't make too much of a fuss. I guess I looked pretty much the same after a fight as I did any other day when I came home from school. I was a natural tomboy and a natural slob. My blouse was always hanging out of my skirt, one of my socks always fell down in my shoe, and my hair always flew wild around my head. I always managed to get something torn and dirty, and because I was awkward and clumsy, I always looked like the victim of about 50 wars. Most of our fights started over petty disputes, like stepped-on shoes, flying spitballs, and contested ownership of pens and pencils. But behind our fights, self-hatred was clearly visible. Nappy head, nappy head, I catch your ass, you gonna be dead. You think you black and ugly now? I'm gonna beat you till you purple. You just another nigga to me. I'm gonna show you what I do with niggas like you. You better shut your big blubber lips. We would call each other jungle bunnies and bush boogies. We would talk about each other's ugly big lips and flat noses. We would call each other pickaninnies and nappy haired so and so's. At your age, not your color, we would tell each other. You're going to thank me when I'm through with you. I'm going to beat you so bad, I'm going to beat the black off of you. Black made any insult worse. When you called somebody a bastard, that was bad. But when you called somebody a black bastard, now that was terrible. In fact, when I was growing up, being called black, period, was grounds for fighting. Who you call them black, we would say. We had never heard the words, black is beautiful, and the idea had never occurred to most of us. I hated for my grandmother to comb my hair, and she hated to comb it. My hair has always been thick and long and nappy, and it would give my grandmother hell. She has straight hair, so she was impatient with mine. When she combed my hair, she would always remember something I had done wrong the day before or earlier that day and pop me in the head with the comb. She would always tell me during these sessions, Now when you grow up, I want you to marry some man with good hair, so your children will have good hair. You hear me? Yes, grandmother. I used to wonder why she hadn't followed her own advice, since my grandfather's hair is far from straight, but I never dared ask. My grandmother says, My grandmother just said what everybody knew was a common fact. Good hair was better than bad hair, meaning that straight hair was better than nappy hair. 
When my sister Beverly was little, I remember teasing her about her lips. She has big, beautiful lips, but back then we looked at them as something of a liability. I never thought of them as ugly. My sister always seemed very pretty to me, but her lips were something good to tease her about. I once told her, with those lips, the only thing you've got going for you is your long hair. You better never cut it off. I will never know how much damage all my teasing did to my sister. But I was only saying what everybody knew. Thin little lips were better than big thick lips. Everybody knew that. There was one girl in our school whose mother made her wear a clothespin on her nose to make it thin. There were quite a few girls who tried to bleach their skin white with a bleaching cream and who got pimples instead. And of course, we went to the beauty parlor and got our hair straightened. I couldn't wait to go to the beauty parlor and get my hair all fried up. I wanted Shirley Temple curls, just like Shirley Temple. I hated the smell of fried hair and having my ears burned, but we were taught that women had to make great sacrifices to be beautiful. And everybody knew you had to be crazy to walk the streets with nappy hair sticking out. And of course, long hair was better than short hair. We all knew that. We had been completely brainwashed, and we didn't even know it. We accepted white value systems and white standards of beauty, and at times, we accepted the white man's view of ourselves. We had never been exposed to any other viewpoint. We had never been exposed to any other point of view or any other standard of beauty. From when I was a tot, I can remember other black people saying, Niggas ain't shit. You know how lazy niggas are? Give a nigga an inch and he'll take a mile. Everybody knew what niggas like to do after they eat. Sleep. Everybody knew that niggas couldn't be on time. That's why there was CPT. Colored people's time. Niggas don't take care of nothing. Niggas don't stick together. The list could go on and on. To varying degrees, we accepted these statements as true. And to varying degrees, we made them true within ourselves because we believed them. I entered third grade in PS 154 in Queens. The school was almost all white, and I was the only black kid in my class. Everybody in my family was glad I was going to school in New York. The schools are better, they said. You get a better education up north than in the segregated school down south. School up north was much different for me than school down south. For one thing, the teachers, they were all white, I don't remember having any black teachers until I was in high school, were always grinning at me. And the older I got, the less I liked those grins. I didn't have a name for them, but now I call them the little nigger grins. My third grade teacher was young, blonde, very prissy, and middle class. Whenever I came into the room, she would show me all 32 of her teeth. But there was nothing sincere about her smile. It never made me feel good. There was always something unnatural and exaggerated about her behavior with me. On my first or second day in class, she was teaching us penmanship. Does anybody know how to make a capital L in script? She asked. Nobody raised a hand. Timidly, I did. You know how to do it? She asked incredulously. Yes, I told her. We had that last year down south. Well, come and write it on the blackboard then, she told me. I wrote my pitiful little second grade L on the blackboard. After looking at me and nodding, she made a big fancy L next to mine. Is this what you're trying to make, Joanne? Her expression was smug. The whole class broke out laughing. I wanted to go somewhere and hide. After that, it seemed that every time I mentioned something I learned down south, she got mad. She never saw my raised hand. When she couldn't ignore it, like when no one else raised theirs, she would say something like, Oh, do you know the answer, Joanne? Every holiday, a class was assigned to put on a play. There were plays for Columbus Day, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Our class had George Washington's birthday. And our play was about his cutting down this cherry tree when he was a little boy. I was selected to be in the play. I was tickled pink and so proud. I was cast as one of the cherry trees. The teacher put some green crepe paper over my head and told me to stand at the back of the stage where I was to stay until the end of the play. Then the cherry trees were supposed to sway from side to side singing... George Washington never told a lie, never told a lie, he never told a lie. George Washington never told a lie, and the truth goes marching on. 
I didn't know what a fool they had made out of me until I grew up and started to read real history. Not only was George Washington probably a big liar, but he had once sold a slave for a keg of rum. Here they had this old cracker slave master who didn't give a damn about black people, and they had me, an unwitting black child, doing a play in his honor. When George Washington was fighting for freedom in the Revolutionary War, he was fighting for the freedom of whites only, rich whites at that. After the so-called revolution, you couldn't vote unless you were a white man and you owned a plot of land. The Revolutionary War was led by some rich white boys who got tired of paying heavy taxes to the king. It didn't have anything at all to do with freedom, justice, and equality for all. Again, in the fourth grade, I was the only black kid in my class. My teacher, Mr. Trobovitz, was cool, though, and a very good teacher. He had modern ideas about teaching, and instead of making us read those old, boring readers, he had us read real books and write reports about them. His class was always interesting. He told us all kinds of jokes and stories, and he seemed to be sincerely concerned about us. That year, we were learning about the Civil War and about Lincoln freeing the slaves. Like all other teachers, Mr. Trobovitz taught us fairy tale history, but at least he made it interesting. That year, I was crazy about Lincoln. I memorized the entire O oh, Captain, My Captain by Walt Whitman and recited it to the class. Little did I know that Lincoln was an arch racist who openly expressed his disdain for black people. He was of the opinion that black people should be forcibly deported to Africa or anywhere else. We had been taught that the Civil War was fought to free the slaves, and it was not until I was in college that I learned that the Civil War was fought for economic reasons. The fact that official slavery was abolished was only incidental. Northern industrialists were fighting to control the economy. Before the Civil War, the northern industry economy was largely dependent on southern cotton. The slave economy of the South was a threat to northern capitalism. What if the slaveholders of the South decided to set up factories and process the cotton themselves? Northern capitalists could not possibly compete with slave labor, and their capitalist economy would be destroyed. To ensure that this didn't happen, the North went to war. When I was still in fourth grade, I fell off a swing and broke my leg. Mr. Trobovitz came to my house and gave me lessons and assignments. When I returned to school, Mr. Trobovitz had left to teach in college. Everybody in the class was sad. A bird-beaked, stick-to-the-book, teach-by-rote teacher had replaced him. She made us get back to reading in the readers and change the desks around so that once again we were sitting in rows. I didn't like her, and she bored me to death. One time, our class had a dance. It was a big event for me since I love to dance. The white kids couldn't dance for nothing. They looked like a bunch of drunken kangaroos, hopping all over the place, out of time with the music... I sat there with my hand over my mouth, trying to suppress my laughter. I ached to get out there and show them how to do it, but nobody asked me to dance. I don't think it ever occurred to them, and if it did, they knew better. Dancing with a nigger was surely good for a week or so of teasing. But these whites were not at all out in the open with their racism. It was undercover, like their parents' racism. Anyhow, I just sat there, looking at them flop around, until this one kid, I'll never forget his name, Richard Kennedy, he was a poor Irish kid with red hair, came over to where I was sitting and said, if you give me a dime, I'll dance with you. The sad part of the story is that I almost gave him the dime. In fifth grade, I was put into the class of the school's most notorious battle axe, Mrs. Hoffler. I knew from the first day it was going to be a long, hot year. The only good thing was that there was another black kid in the class. The teacher put us in the back, next to each other. His name was David something, but I'll call him David Pekin. The teacher was one of those military types, and her classes resembled boot camps. We were told where to sit, how to sit, and what kind of notebooks, pens, pencils, etc. to use. She permitted no talking and gave us tons of homework. Her punishment for everything was extra homework. Whenever somebody got caught talking or doing anything she disapproved of, she gave extra homework. When you didn't have your homework, she gave extra homework. And every time she gave you extra homework, she wrote your name on the blackboard and refused to remove it until you had turned in the punishment. By the time I left her class, my name practically covered the entire blackboard. David and I were her favorite targets. The whole class would be in an uproar, but we were the only ones she saw with our mouths open. The more she rode our backs, the more rebellious I came. 
I would sit in the back of the class and make jokes about her. One day, when we were talking and giggling, she came up and pulled David out of his seat by the ear, twisting it until the whole side of his face was red and contorted with pain. I made up my mind right then and there that she wasn't going to do it to me. A few days later, she came after me. When she put her hands on me, I kicked her. Or hit her. I don't remember which. Anyway, the next thing I knew, I was in the principal's office being sent home with a note. I was scared to death my mother would find out. So I signed the note myself and brought it to school the next day. My signature didn't fool anybody. To make a long story short, when my mother found out, I confessed everything, and I told her about Mrs. Hoffler. I think she had some idea about what was going on, because she had seen a change in me. I had always been very quiet and obedient in school. My mother went to the school, talked to the teacher and the principal, and demanded I be moved to another class. It's a good thing she wasn't one of those parents who believe the teacher is always right, because I don't know what would have happened. I guess the fact that she's a teacher and acutely aware of the racism and hostility that black children are exposed to from the time they enter school had something to do with it. I don't remember the name of my other fifth grade teacher, except that it was a mile long and began with a Z. But she was very nice and a very good teacher. She introduced us to art, literature, and philosophy. I remember studying the French Revolution in her class. She made names like Marie Antoinette, Charlotte Godet, and Robespierre come alive. She talked about philosophers like Rousseau, who influenced the thinking of the period, and about how the French Revolution was influenced by the American Revolution. She even showed us pictures of the art and architecture of the period. She was the first teacher, one of a very few, who taught subjects as if they related to each other. Before I was in her class, I would never have imagined that history was connected to art, that philosophy was connected to science, and so on. The usual way that people are taught to think in America is that each subject is in a little compartment and has no relation to any other subject. For the most part, we receive fragments of unrelated knowledge, and our education follows no logical format or pattern. It is exactly this kind of education that produces people who don't have the ability to think for themselves, and who are easily manipulated. As we grew older, the differences between black and white, the poor and rich students, grew bigger and bigger. Once, a new teacher told us to make mobiles as homework. Most of us brought in cardboard, wood, or paper mobiles. One kid brought in a mobile made out of metals. Not just one kind of metal, but metals of different colors. I was in awe of this kid, who had the resources to cut all those different, perfectly formed geometric shapes. Calder would have taken notice. The school was in a largely Jewish, middle-class neighborhood. There was a little island of black people in the middle, and that was where I lived. It was almost completely segregated from the white section. The school was right in the middle. In most of the black families, the mother and father both worked, and many worked two or three jobs and weren't able to spend a lot of time in the school. But some of the white parents were there for every little thing, from trips to cookie selling, and talk about pushy parents. To this day, I believe that some of them did most of their kids' homework. Black kids wrote a composition or a book report on plain lined paper and handed it in. Some of the white kids presented their reports bound in expensive binders. Some were typed and each page was covered in plastic. I could just imagine asking my mother to type my homework for me or to give me money to buy binders and plastic sheets. She surely would have thought I had gone crazy. The white kids came to school with all kinds of junk, expensive pen and pencil sets, compasses, and one kid even had a slide rule, which I doubt he had the faintest idea how to use. The older they grew, the more snobbish the white kids became. They were always talking about what they had and what their parents had bought them. One girl, Marsha, horribly ugly to me, was always dressed like some kid in the movies or on TV. She was one of the super snobs in the class. One day she came to school with weird-looking mittens on. She said they were made of chinchilla and that it was the most expensive fur in the world. I raced home to ask my mother. I just knew she had to be lying because I had never even heard of chinchilla, and everybody I knew thought that mink was the most expensive fur on the market. I was really shocked when my mother told me she was telling the truth. Every year, when we came back to school, we would inevitably be told to write a composition entitled My Summer Vacation. Usually, we stood in front of the classroom and read our compositions aloud. I was always fascinated by some of the places these kids had been to during the summer. 
places like Spain, England, Brazil, and Bermuda. Some of them even brought slides and movies of their trips. After they finished talking, I wouldn't even want to read my composition about being down south with my grandparents. One of the things that had been drilled into my head since birth was that we were just as good as white people. You show those white people that you are just as good as they are, I was told. This meant that I was to get good marks in school, that I was to always be neat and clean when I went to school, and that I was to speak as properly as they did, and that I would show them whenever I could that black people, we called ourselves Negroes then, could do whatever white people could do, and that we could appreciate what white people appreciated. Right on. Context of white supremacy. We are on page, well, for me, it is page 37, uh, depending on which version you have, but we're right a few pages before the end of chapter two. That's what we'll be picking up at for next week, uh, very close to the end of chapter two. If folks would like to chime in, the number to dial 760 76 Seven six. The code is five six four nine four three pound. Press star six if you would like to participate. Uh, we have about a half hour left, so feel free. Should have ample time for folks to get their comments in. Everyone with a hand up, your line should be open. <laughs> yes, greetings. I, uh, this takes time. I took a few notes on, uh, the last reading. I saw off of number one. Uh, I was hearing, I was, uh, uh, hearing, uh, someone, uh, was measuring, uh, success by the financial proximity to uh, white people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that still is very popular today amongst victims of white supremacy. Uh, number two, thinking, speaking, and acting outside of the box of white supremacy should be the goal by all of us at some point in time. Uh, Number three, the, uh, she was talking about the, the beach. Uh, I'm, uh, of course, is, uh, I'm from, uh, South Florida, uh, very well known for its quote unquote beach areas. Uh, for a long time, uh, in my childhood, uh, there was only one, and I'm pretty sure this history is, is pretty common amongst black people. I've heard it before on the program to where black people were restricted on what, on where they can go to a beach. Uh, and uh, normally it would be uh, the worst possible uh, area that's connected with the quote-unquote ocean uh, if you are somewhere within a proximity of something called the ocean. And in this case, it was a place called Virginia Key Beach. It still, it still is, is, uh, is around today, but, uh, it was actually, uh, used by, by Dave, the, the county of Dave County as a sewage area. Uh, literally a sewage area where, uh, black people were allowed to, uh, to, uh, go to the beach, uh, down here for a long period of time. Uh, number four, uh, I was just listening and uh, earlier in the, uh, in the, uh, talk and, uh, it just, uh, I just thought about, uh, how, how white supremacy, uh, the, uh, the, the, our reaction to, uh, uh, white supremacy and, and, and in turn it, it materialized into, uh, uh, black self-hate. Uh, it's very deep. Uh, what she was saying was true about, uh, white man and white woman 
lying about uh, their willingness to engage in war. They would make up some sort of uh, almost glamorous excuse, uh, for, for instance, about what she was saying about World War One, And basically that came about, that I just mentioned briefly, came about due to a conference that these white people sat around a table and, and uh, decided on carving up the non-white world. And just like what thieves do, they kind of renege on their, their, uh, their uh, organizing, and by 1914, they fought over it. And they fought over it again in 1939. Uh, what we know is World War II. Is it was like uh, Godfather I and Godfather II, if you will. Uh, uh, number six, passing, uh, passing on a disease of, of anti-blackness uh, in the many different examples she gave of uh, criticisms, and uh, unfortunately, uh, a a newer twenty first century version of that uh, still goes on, still goes on the same uh, body parts uh, that we have been trained to uh, hate uh, uh, from our uh, white masters. Uh, we still, unfortunately, carry that on. A uh, good part about it is they they have been. Uh, more and more people who have been engaging into the scientific uh, efforts to to uh, uh, solve that problem. Uh, there, there are people who are working at that on a daily basis, uh, uh, as far as my observations. Uh, the more, the better. Uh, the self-torture, uh, what I call self-torture, that uh, beautiful, our beautiful... Uh, uh, black females go through. Uh, it kind of like gave me memories uh, with uh, the burning of the hair and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, unfortunately, there's a 20, 21st century version of that still going on. Uh, not too far from where I go and get uh, groceries right next to it. And it's on purpose that this place is right next to a large grocery store. It's called Diamond Girl. Uh, uh, and non-white black people don't have any uh, uh, financial investment into it at all, but it's constantly uh, where beautiful black females are going in and out of this place uh, looking for uh, beauty in all of the wrong places, if you ask me. Uh, uh, number nine, uh, I, I was interested in a comment, and I've heard this comment quite a, quite a bit of times, uh, where she said, uh, I forgot what exactly what context it was said in, but she said it was tickled pink. Uh, and what it seems to do is measure happiness to a white standard. So when you're tickled pink, uh, I don't know too many non-white uh, black people who, uh, especially those those of us who are heavily melanated who uh, can uh, identify with being pink anywhere other than the palms of our hands, I guess. Uh, uh, number nine, I like, uh, I like her mix with the, uh, with the white racist propaganda and, and how she came, would come back and, and come with the uh, white supremacist reality. Uh, for instance, uh, with some notable figures like uh, Old Abe, uh, 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 Lincoln, uh, uh, and what was uh, the propaganda about uh, the Emancipation Proclamation and what was actually reality. Same thing with George Washington. And I went through that same story story page uh, at the same time in elementary school. Uh, it, 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 uh, it could be that uh, I think she was a part of the first generation of quote-unquote baby, baby boomers, and I was Born in 1957, which probably the second generation of, of and, and all of us had that same propaganda uh, thrusted into our uh, heads uh, when we were in elementary school with this some some white man who never told a lie and all that kind of foolishness. Uh, number ten, uh, uh, we'll have to to leave it there just to make sure. Oh, yes, I, 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 okay, yeah, <laughs> thank you. For sure, for sure. Uh, the caller at nine two nine eight nine two nine eight. Did you uh, have comments you wanted to share as well? You should be with us. Yeah, 
I uh, this is Lady House, everyone on the line. Um, I'm really just, and I don't know if anyone can help me out with this. I do not understand what is the obsession with keeping melanated people away from water, bodies of water, beaches, pools. I'm I'm just not grasping what was the point of whites in this action. You know, is, was it just keeping melanated people away from the beauty of the beach? I don't know what they were trying to get at. So this is something that is very recurrent and even access today for a lot of people to those things. It's hard, whether it be through transportation of getting to the beach, to the expenses of going to beaches, and um, clean and well-kept pool areas during the summer. Um, I, could, I don't know if someone could help me out with, with that. I can, at least my comment or, or thought on, on your question, um, the books that we just read, I said that was part of the push for why I said let's do Asada Shakur. Nathan Connolly uh, his or actually, well, both of the books really Nathan Connolly, but I guess especially if you're focusing on waterfront property, the land was ours. Uh, uh, Andrew Carl, he's a white man, racist suspect, but the book has a lot of accurate information, and his book specifically is focused on how racist deliberately exactly what she said about the the line where her uh, family members had property. And the white peak, she said, white lawyers specifically, <laughs> the white lawyers went in and ended up having to pay for the property twice. Uh, that white people did this sort of thing in a variety of ways, sometimes with property taxes or whatever, um, and taking beachfront property, waterfront property from black people. That originally a lot of black people got this property because it was not valuable. It wasn't built up. You didn't have all the infrastructure and everything. It was, it was uh, not you know, the way it's, it wasn't thought of the way it was today. But then when Weiss decided that they were going to make this property valuable, they just went about skeeving and uh, terrorizing to take it from black people. But, uh, yeah, it, I think it's widespread. It's a lot of, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, motivating factors behind that. Uh, probably first and foremost, I would say it's just racism, white supremacy, and not wanting black people to uh, to have anything, particularly anything of, of value. Uh, and the whole, I've said this before when we talked about those books, there's a whole body of research literature uh, on black people and access to swimming pools and bodies of water. I mean, it's, that is a whole field of research on racism to itself. And I will stop there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Gus. Um, it, it, this is very interesting to me. Uh, I, you know, I'm just beginning to think that they don't need a reason except for whatever the reason is at that particular time. You know, if they come up with one, I think it's almost let's go with it and let's implement it. Um, whether it be with access to things like beaches and swimming pools or access to, you know, a bucket of paint. <laughs> I don't think it really matters um, as long as they feel like they have a reason and they move from there. Um, I'll go ahead and, and mute my line and kind of meditate on that. <laughs> I agree. I think that line of, of thinking, I uh, I totally agree. Uh, the person that dialed in, make sure we didn't miss anybody. At uh, I think this is Joy. Uh, if you had uh, feedback you wanted to share as well, your line should be open. Hi, thank you, Gus. Hello, everyone. Um, I thought it was really interesting the comment she made. You know, uh, I couldn't hear it all because I was still kind of on the road, but. Uh, uh, once she said that she was speaking Spanish, or was it her aunt that was speaking Spanish? And then they were laughing because it, it seemed that um, as long as you were um, not black, you could get your or the um, the the immigrant non-black non-white people could get more respect than black people that had been here for you know centuries. And I think that that's still the case now. But but it's interesting. It's an interesting dynamic, and um, um, that's one of the things I'm I'm trying to 
kind of deal with at work. And then, um, um, you know, the things when she, were, she was younger and they were talking about the hair, um, you know, I had the hair uh, thing going on too because in our family, you know, all this is kind of odd. All the girls were... Um, we were all born bald headed, you know. My mother, you know, she he had had to put caps on us, but later on we had, you know, just a ton of hair, and it would always be an issue, you know, from um, you know people that's gone out one day, you know, they um, dealing with the bullies, they uh, just beat grabbed me one day and they just cut off all my hair. You know that that kind of thing. So hopefully now it's not too much of an issue, but it's just it's just like um, almost the way things continue on and on. You know the same issues. We we never learn, and it doesn't get any better. And then um, the the first part of the book it really kind of upset me quite a bit. Just the thought of how they um, treated. Asada, while she was, you know, basically recuperating. I know they thought they needed to find out what happened, but just the cruelty of it, it just really upset me. I just, I just, you know, even though I'm still learning, and I understand that, I just cannot understand these people. You know, sometimes I wonder if they really are people, some of the, the cruel and inhuman things that they do. And um, um, that's that's all I had to say. And thank you again. You picked an excellent book. Appreciate it. Uh, think the caller. Just making sure we don't miss anybody who hasn't been able to participate. Uh, the caller ninety four hundred ninety four hundred. Did you have anything you wanted to share? Yeah. Um, with regard to the um, body of water question. Um, first off, the lady was really hard to hear, it, but um, in my opinion, I'm a I'm a, 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 a junior lifeguard, and my mother came from the south and came, you know, to the west, and uh, it was just a really big deal for her for us to learn to swim and do it um, to the point where we were proficient, and um, I think it had to do with a whole bunch of um, psycho psychology, um, having people one deny access to something that was fun and enjoyable, two having them have uh, you know uh, if if something happened there was an accident the likelihood of their death, um, so people would be scared like my mother was scared scared of deep water I'm like you know why you just you know you just don't go to the bottom you know but she was she had a fear of it. You know, even when she went to go swim and watching her, she was just terrified. And fear overrules so many other emotions, even love. And um, I, I just, um, I just think it was a, re uh, I mean, because you heard it in the twelve years of slave. You, you know, in in that book, you heard heard them talk about, you know, um, them not learning how to swim because they would keep them in. Uh, keep them in a certain area. If they were, you know, and all kinds, it's just a multitude of, uh, of different things. Like you said, there's a, you know, um, I just wanted to put that part of it in. And this, yeah, this was a good book uh, so far. I'm liking it. And it's a good choice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If folks want to get more uh, details, uh, there's a different book called Contested Waters, A Social History of Swimming Pools in America. Uh, the author is Jeff Wiltz. Uh, you can check that out. Uh, and I would encourage if it's beach or waterfront property specifically, the land was ours, Andrew Carl. And he was just on the program about 10 days ago. He's a white person, but it has a lot of information. And you will see Asada Shakur and Evelyn Williams uh, cited some of the passage that, passages that we just heard are uh, cited in that book. And there are many, many examples of exactly what she's talking about here uh, throughout the country, not just in uh, North Carolina, Wilmington. Uh, I will 
get in quickly before I nab uh, if anybody else has things that they want to share. Uh, black self-respect. So much of this just black self-respect. I think when her grandmother was kind of uh, instilling in her that she look white people in the eyes and speak clearly and speak loudly. Um, black self, just Dr. Welsing, black self-respect, black self-respect, black self-respect. Um, the erosion of the land that she talks about, that is, there is extensive detail about how even that is an act of racism on the part of whites. I would read the passage to you, but it would take up too much time, but it's in, uh, Andrew Carl, the land was ours, where he talks about how uh, white people went playing God uh, and drudged uh, this channel through, and it ended up causing just, I mean, they lost scores of acres of property uh, behind them doing this. It's just been horrid. And there's a there's a pattern of that as well. Uh, the environment, what they call environmental racism and doing things to damage and uh, toxify land where black people are going to reside. Um, the having a job, I know 909 talks about that a lot, where she, uh, Asada Shakur, she talks about working in the parking lot uh, for her grandparents' business. And, you know, sometimes it'd be an all-day thing if there were a lot of people and, and all that. But 909 just talks about that a lot, the importance of having a job. The passage, epic, the passage where she talks about uh, just the names, the name-calling, the self-hate, the anti-blackness, the contamination of white supremacy. That is epic uh, passage. Uh, any adding black to anything. I remember that was one of the more profound moments when I read this book the first time when she said uh, black was an insult. Adding black to anything made it way worse. Like, wow. Um, the uh, not allowing black to, the land was ours. Andrew Carl not allowing black people to eat. That was standard operating procedure. Um, scary. I heard that pop up. Even some of our listeners mentioned the term. Uh, it was scary what they were dealing with. And she even says the night when her grandfather got the rifle, black self-defense, black self-defense, not nonviolence, gets his rifle to defend his family, his black family. And she said, you know, that's great. But I mean, it showed that it was frightening. That is what the system of white supremacy is designed to produce. That is the goal of of terrorism. Um, the step on the, the self hate that came up to, uh, typical pink. I had that as well. And finally, just when she was talking about Abraham Lincoln, I think one of our previous calls said she was kind of coming in and giving the, the codified, um, accurate perspective on these folks where she mentioned Abraham Lincoln, Walt Whitman was also an explicit avowed racist and made all kinds of public statements about how he didn't think very much of niggers and that we were mostly stupid and he had never said anything about the nigger question because black people are so dumb. Uh, we've talked about this before. You can go back in the archives uh, and hear the program we did with Timothy McNair. This is back in uh, 2013. Uh, this is a black grad student at uh, Northwestern University in Illinois. He refused to recite uh, any of Walt Whitman's work because he is a racist, white supremacist. And uh, yeah, you can go back in the archives. Anyway, uh, those are some of the things that stood out. We have about eight minutes left. If folks have other things they want to make sure they touch on before we conclude. May I be heard? Uh, Go ahead, Karma. Um, I just like to say that I was noticing I, I was I was I was living all of her experiences again, just starting with the first white teacher in the third grade and being on the beach and thinking, you know, the beach is the most amazing thing and and then having the parents tell you that you're just as good as white people and then do that completely schizophrenic thing about your bad hair, your big lips, and don't play with those other black people. So, I mean, I was saying, wow, that was me and that was my childhood. But then again, when we read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks and, you know, and you're getting TB from your relatives and everybody has alcoholism and you've got the pedophile uncle. I mean, I was empathetic. I mean, empathizing. I, I was saying, wow, I lived all of that, too. So it shows you how important the author is, because when the white woman was writing the book, everything was about, you know, the pathology of the black family. 
which actually I went through all of that. But when you have a black woman writing a book, you don't get all of that emphasis emphasis on the pathology, and you you realize just how great of a childhood you you, you had. And I mean, it, it's amazing that I am completely seeing myself in both of these books at both of these times. So I mean, it lets me know how important the writer is. And um, another thing I'm 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 noticing is the absence of religion. There's no there's no emphasis on religion in this book at all. Well, there's tons of it in the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. So. Hmm. Wish I had made that point when we were reading Henrietta Lacks. Man, that's a keen observation there, Karma. Uh, the Was that Mr. Demery for? Yes, ma'am, dear. Yes, sir. Okay, those words were taken right out of my mouth. Because I wanted to say that I was surprised that the Bible or white Christianity, white Jesus, is not mentioned yet. But they did mention that uh, one person was saying, I can't stand the sun because I'm too black already. You know, we got some anti-blackness going on here when the... I wanted to start the commentary out with the theft of black land. Um which is prevalent, and you made a good point, and you made reference to the uh, reading material. <laughs> you know, that's very good. And another way is <laughs> white people were able to steal the uh, natural resources beneath the land that was uh, formerly black people. You know, black people unknowingly gave up uh, rights to minerals beneath the land. And I thought that was interesting and should be brought up. <laughs> but the, the grandma said that white people don't want you to have nothing. And you should know that. And if you're hearing it from your grandma, like I heard it from mine, it, it sticks with you. Because even if you investigate yourself, you'll find out that grandma was right. But then again, when they start talking about alley rap, you know, versus the decent children, you know, from the higher economic uh, uh, standings in the community, you know, a shot did not uh, buy into those social status, you know, that was erected by a system of white supremacy, racism, racist society. Um, the old lady who had never seen the beach, you know, was sad. And this book reminds me of Maya Angelou. Um, the stories about the spooks and the hanks, the superstition that persists into African American literature and culture. And also, she worked in a store. Also, and uh, they had some real similarity. I also made a note of the quote about the red-blooded American guys just letting off steam when in actuality they were acts of terrorism, firing guns and shouting racist slurs and probably harming other people. Um, and last, talk about conditioning. Ashada Shakur wanted Shirley Temple curls. I mute my line. Thank you. For sure. For sure. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And also, um, I wanted to relate. Um, I was one of those kids who were was bused into a white school during desegregation um, in the late 70s. And so I can relay, I, I went from a black school with white teachers, a black principal and a few black teachers, to a white school. And I remember my mother insisting when we went to the white school that my brother would have a black male teacher. And she worked in the school district, but not as a teacher, but as um, 
one of the um, cafeteria workers, and she knew that they had first taken up all the best black teachers from the black school, put them in a white school, and then took the worst teachers, white teachers, from the white school and put them in the black school. And so we were segregated with my mother's plan of chasing after good black teachers. <laughs> Which I thought, I mean, however you can get it done, however you can get it done, which is great. And um, I was listening when she was saying the parents were in the school, and um, I was in a, uh, even though we were lower middle class, I was in a regular middle class amongst black people, black middle class area. <clears throat> and for the most part, in the, in the black areas, the parents were in the school because most of the mothers were housewives. They didn't work in elementary school. I don't know what happened because I left that area, left the school. But they were, the mom and were very instrumental in the school. And they, even though they were instrumental in the school, they didn't have power to stop those white, bad white teachers from coming in and the exodus of the good white teachers by the school board with their master plan, calling it, you know, um, desegregation, taking good black teachers out of, out of black schools. And, um, and I just remember is how we structure our family, just like Church Welding said, even birds with their little bitty brains know enough to build their nest first. We have to decide, just like they, those black people in that neighborhood where I grew up decided that their wives, for the most part, the wives weren't going to work. And that's what, you know, they busted, they, those men busted their butts, making sure that their wives could do just that, go to the schools but have free time to cook, go to the schools and do things like that. And so we have to decide how. And what, and sometimes we have to give up stuff to get what we want so our children will be given the best opportunity to be the best. And I'll meet my lunch. I know. That will wrap things up for session number one. Um, it's looking like if I had to uh, give an estimate, we will be on this book for. I don't know, maybe eight sessions. We'll see. Depends on uh, their poems. Some of these uh, pages are, are poems because we started off with the poem today. So that'll read a little faster. So I don't know. Buckle up should be good. Uh, and as it great time. This is one where uh, you should kind of scout the news regularly. Um, Marco Rubio, uh, presidential candidate. Uh, he was talking about uh, Asada Shakur and referenced her as a terrorist in Cuba and giving his opinion on the negotiations on what's happening there. There's so many different things that are uh, happening. I think this is the 40 year anniversary uh, of the shooting, unless I have my dates off a little bit, but uh, it's, it's in the news every day. Her name is in the news in connection to so many different uh, things that are happening. The protests uh, at the university of California, Berkeley uh, as well. You can see Common's response. He was uh, canceled. Uh, he was invited to give a speech at a college, uh, Northeast, I believe. And then they, uh, it surfaced that he did this song for us. And they uh, canceled, said, we can't have you come in here. I think some of the uh, officers in New Jersey, they uh, voiced their uh, grievances about him being a part of the uh, participation. And uh, as I said, Common gave his response this week. Anyway, um, before we conclude um, the, I thought the, the part about the zoo when she was saying that uh, she wanted to go to the zoo really bad and her grandparents wouldn't take her and she thought that they were mean and you know whatever and then finally her grandmother explained that they didn't allow black people at the zoo I thought that was important just because it's been my experience that it's it's very similar to what she explained about how she was saying that they believed uh, all they just accepted all of the contamination, all of the lies that uh, black people are lazy, black people can't take care of anything, black people you know can't be on time uh, about things that they just if you do not blame indict white people for the practice of white supremacy. It's got to be that black people are inferior and you just go to town blaming 
black people. But I thought even that illustration right there, because she began to think uh, that it, this was her grandmother just being lame, like her grandmother was just being whack and not taking her to the zoo. And that's not what it was at all. Uh, I'm certain because I've heard this so many times from different parents throughout down through generations of parents that it's just painful trying to explain this to your uh, offspring that we are in a total system of terrorism and I'm in a very weak position. You are in a a very weak position and it's a whole lot of things that are very unpleasant as a result of white people. Uh, That is a very ugly conversation to have with your child. Uh, but I thought that was a significant moment as well. Anywho, lots of significant moments, uh, so much, uh, in the book and, uh, looking forward. We'll be back next week, 8 PM Eastern, 5 PM Pacific. Uh, as always, if you have comments, uh, that you want to get in from people who are listening to the archive, feel free, email them until justice at gmail.com until justice at gmail.com on Twitter at until justice at until justice uh so you can email or tweet uh comments thoughts uh, about the reading and we can share them next week with the listeners thanks everyone for calling in and participating i hope it was a constructive investment of your friday evening we will be back in about 24 hours for the compensatory call-in uh review of uh, news and what has happened over the past seven days workplace racism uh looking forward to hearing from listeners Uh, Tomorrow evening, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Pacific, compensatory call-in, context of white supremacy. If you would like to invest in the program, listener-supported, counter-racist radio, the blog racism-notes.blogspot.com, racism-notes.blogspot.com PayPal is in the top right corner if you're not feeling PayPal drop me an email and we can get you a mailing address if you would like to invest in the program Uh, huge thanks to all the folks who have contributed down through the years I hope the program has been and continues to be a constructive investment of your time and energy. Thanks all for tuning in. Uh, Again, I know that it's getting warm. Very nice weather. Folks want to be out and doing all that good stuff. That's great. Uh, Be codified. Be safe. Uh, I would again encourage sobriety would be best under conditions of white terrorism. You definitely do not want to be behind the wheel. Uh, I don't think you want to be a passenger under the influence or a pedestrian. Uh, I think You're just uh, making it easy for race soldiers to terrorize and make unnecessary problems for you. You don't want to be drinking or in the presence of intoxicated whites. And you even want to be very cautious about the victims, non-white people whose presence you are in, if they or you are going to consume any intoxicants. Again, sobriety would be best. That's it. Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time. We are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible. Context of white supremacy signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, no brother. Problem. You're a victim. Mm. I'm a victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned.